Stephen King once wrote that nightmares exist outside of logic, and there's little fun to be had in explanations. They're antithetical to the poetry of fear. In a horror story, the victim keeps asking why, but there can be no explanation, and there shouldn't be one. The unanswered mystery is what stays with us the longest, and is what we'll remember in the end. My name is Alan Wake. I'm a writer. I've always had a vivid imagination, but this dream unsettled me. It was wild and dark and weird, even by my standards. So yes, it began with a dream. Following a typical nightmare pattern, I was late, desperately trying to reach my destination, a lighthouse, for some urgent reason I couldn't remember. I'd been driving too fast down a coastal road to get there. seen the hitchhiker too late. He was dead. I was convinced they'd put me in jail and I would never see Alice again. Suddenly, his body was gone. I was in shock from the crash. I could hardly stand my feet. The radiator had broken when I hit the hitchhiker. The car wasn't going anywhere. I was certain I had just driven from this direction, but now the road was blocked. I had to go to the lighthouse. I knew there was something important waiting for me there. The bridge had collapsed. I'd have to find another way to the lighthouse. You miss! 
missed your deadline! Hitchhiker was a character from the story I'd been working on. How does it feel to die by the hands of your own creation? Still inside, controlling him. 
He can't be saved. He's still a threat. He is still your enemy. Here, take the gun. safe place on Earth. Just another nightmare. Everything's fine. You dozed off. Right. Anything more than dozed off would be news for everyone. Cheer up, handsome. We're here.
Let's act like we're on vacation. Go stand next to that old gentleman there. I want a shot of you with the town in the background. <laughs> sure. I'll even give you a title for the shot. A city boy, moments before he got eaten by a bear. Hi. Hello there. You picked a good time to visit our town. Deerfest is just two weeks away. Deerfest, huh? Did you hear that, honey? You have a lovely wife. If you don't mind me saying. I'm Pat Main, by the way. Nice to meet you. Yeah, I'm Alan Wake. I won't pretend I don't recognize a famous writer such as yourself, Mr. Wake. A pleasure. I'm an avid reader myself. I hope this isn't too presumptuous of me, but I'm the night host at the local radio station. Any chance I could get an interview? Look, Mr. Maine, I'm on vacation. In fact, I'd appreciate it if we could keep my being here just between the two of us. I'm sure you understand. Fair enough. I, you can trust me to be this year. Not a hard man to track down if you change your mind, though. I hope you two have a lovely holiday. Very nice. I got a couple of really good ones. I see you made a friend. That's cute. Right. Yeah? Hey, bestseller. That was my favorite writer. Are you there yet? Very. Yeah. We just got here. Are the locals giving you trouble? Just say the word, and I'll hop on a plane and come make sure that you're left alone, Al. No, Barry. We're fine. Great. Great. Just want to make sure you can relax and recharge. So, how is the place? Has it gotten your creative juices flowing? Barry, we're just settling in. Okay, Al. I'll call back later to make sure you're doing okay. And you call me if there's a problem, okay? Okay. I'm just looking out for you, buddy. Talk to you later. I love you too, Barry. You know he's going to be calling you every five minutes. Barry is Barry. I can always turn off the phone. What did I tell you? Text message from Barry. He says hi to you, too. Alan, we're here. Come on, let's get back to the car. Come on, Slowpoke. You get the full service here. I've made all the arrangements. I drive the car. I'll even carry the bags. All you have to do is drag your cute butt into the car and enjoy the ride. Yeah, sounds like you've got a lazy bastard for a husband. <laughs> yeah, but I got a thing for him. Come on, you lazy bastard. Let's go. <laughs> Damn yuppies. Let's see who has the last laugh, city boy. Okay. Good day to you, too. Let's get back in the car and drive to the town. We're here! We need to stop at the local diner to get the cabin key from the landlord. A Mr. Carl Stuckey. He's waiting for us. I'll go fill her up while you get the key. I'll pick you up here in, say, 15 minutes? Sure. Alan, thank you for coming here with me. I love you, too. Go on. I'll promise to behave. I'd forgotten there were still places like this. Towns where everybody knew everybody. Welcome to the Oh Dear Diner. Hi, I was wondering if you could help me. I'm looking for... Mr. Wake. Alan, Wake. Oh, God! I am your biggest fan. I know people say that all the time, but I really am. I'm glad to hear that. Rose. Rose, I'm looking for Mr. Stuckey. Carl Stuckey? Carl? Oh, of course, Mr. Wake. He must have gone to visit the restroom. He'll be back in a moment. I can't believe it. I've got all of your books. I got the cutout from the bookstore when they took it out of the window. <laughs> and you keep it here. Well, okay. Good for you. Try the coffee. Just don't blame me when you fall in love, because it'll break your heart when you have to leave. Rusty here is no longer human. 
Nothing but black coffee under a thin layer of skin. Yeah, that makes two of us. Are you staying long, Mr. Wake? I can't believe it. I'm having a conversation with Alan Wake. Are you on your own, or is your wife with you? I can show you the town if you want. I get off work at six. <laughs> Thanks, Rose. We'll be sure to keep that in mind. Right. So much for a quiet vacation. Do me a favor, Sonny! I could really use a tune right now. Coconut, number six in the jukebox. I'd do it myself, but both of my legs have gone to sleep. Bad circulation. Yeah. Are you serious? Coconut again? You disgust me. Call yourself a rocker. Unbelievable. Ha! You put the lime in the coconut, drink them both up. Just because we're brothers, don't think I won't murder you in your sleep. Yes, that's my favorite tune. Coconut! Shut your mouth, you demented has-been. If I had my hammer, I'd shut it for you. Jeez. Tune number six in the jukebox. Children of the Elder God. Now there's a song for you. It does that, get stuck. Yeah, you need to give it a good solid whack. Now that's what I'm talking about, yes! This is it. I've died and gone to hell. Don't go in there, young man. You can hurt yourself in the dark. I think I can handle it, ma'am. I didn't want to wait. I wanted to find Stucky, to get the key and get out as soon as possible. The waitress was giving me a headache. Overeager fans always did. You don't want to die, do you? Worse. I warned God Stucky about it, but he didn't listen. I told Rose last week that she should change the bulb. This is what happens when you get sloppy. Let's do my round. Remind them to change the bulbs. Oh, stay vigilant. Darkness never sleeps. Hello? Mr. Stuckey? Carl couldn't make it. Unfortunately, he was taken ill. But I have the key for you and instructions on how to get to the lake. Okay. I wish you a good stay in my cabin. I'll come by later to check how you've settled in. And to meet your wife. I insist. Thanks. Cauldron Lake is a special place. Very inspiring. You got lucky this time, young man. You can hurt yourself in the dark. <laughs> This really ought to be fixed, and then I must remind Sarah to change the lights at the station. It's been too long already. I hadn't seen her leave. 
but the old lady was gone. Even that sounds better than you singing. Are you all right? <laughs> splendid, splendid. <laughs> Damn Arnia. It swells up like a balloon if I lift anything heavier than a spoon. Yeah, splendid, splendid. It's been a long time gone. Good to see you. Hey, you wouldn't happen to have a bottle on you, would you, Tom? I wish. The Andersons, they're uh, local musicians. We're waiting for Dr. Hartman to come pick them up. They wandered off from his clinic at the Cauldron Lake Lodge. I'll be heading back to work as soon as Dr. Hartman gets here, Rose. Oh, but I'm not looking forward to the poison we have at the Park Cafe. <sighs> now this is what coffee should taste like. Oh, Rusty, that's so sweet. I'll swing by with the fresh cup later on. Will you be staying in town for the deer fest, Mr. Wink? The deer is dear to me. The deer is dear to me. The deer is dear to me, my dear, in more ways than one. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> That's not really our festival anthem. Could have fooled me there. I had the keys. Alice was outside. I didn't want to keep her waiting. Bye, Mr. Wake. Mission accomplished. The key and the directions. My hero. I got some flashlights, just in case. Hey, wait! Mrs. Wake! Your... Your keys! That diner was a real nut house. <laughs> Can you believe this place? This would make a wonderful setting for a book. We're supposed to be on vacation, Alice. I'll figure it out when we get back home, okay? Okay, we can talk about this later. Bad man here on PBF FM. I didn't want to talk about it. I wanted to bury my head in sand. Here's another one of my favorites to go with it. Once upon a time, I was a successful writer, but that was a long time ago. I hadn't been able to write a word in two years, not since my last book. Clear night, so you folks from the big city might want to look up every once in a while, see those stars winking down at you. It gets pretty dark out here, but they'll light your way. It's gorgeous, Alan. It's something, all right. Don't worry, honey. I'll get you inside safe and sound before it gets dark. And I've got the flashlight. I know. I'm okay. Alice had a phobia. The fear of darkness. I wanted to make sure we were inside with the lights on before sunset. Are you sure you read the directions right? It's nothing like in the brochure said near the lake, not on it. Don't get me wrong. This is so much better. It's wonderful. Our own private island.
The cabin obviously got its name from the shape of the island. It looked like a giant bird leg. Alice had mentioned that the lake was a caldera. There was a dormant volcano under it. Here we go. Let's take a look inside. It's dark in there. We need lights. Can you figure out how to get the power on, honey? Sure thing. I'm on it. Hello? Anyone here? A shoebox filled with books by Thomas Zane sat on the shelf. I'd never heard of him before. The Deer Fest guests have already started to arrive. Just ran into one on the ferry. A famous artist, no less, but we'll see if we can rope him into an interview later on. Now, let's uh, go to the phones. Caller, you're on KBF-FM. Hi, Pat. It's Rose. Well, hello, Rose. What's on your mind? I know who that famous artist was. It was Alan Wake, wasn't it? Uh. He's my favorite writer. Well, Rose, I... I just saw him at the diner. Oh, I am so excited he's here. I'm sure he's glad to be here, too. Well, folks, I guess the secret's out. This is Pat Main on KBF-FM. Now, some music. Great. So much for keeping a low profile. The water was clear but dark. It looked very deep. The cabin looked like a time capsule from the 60s, or even earlier. For a moment, the oppressive feel of the nightmare I had seen on the ferry returned. I needed to get the power running in the cabin. There had to be a fuse box or a generator somewhere on the island.
power cable goes to that shed over there. The island had once been the site for a love story. Maybe it would be that again. Alice had told me about Cauldron Lake Lodge. The old building used to be a hotel, but these days it was no longer open to the public. An old generator had been connected to the power cable. myself I could rest here, sleep here, and forget about my work. I thought we could be happy here. Honey? Alan, I'm upstairs. I have a surprise for you. Well, hello there. I'm not the surprise. It's in the study. Go take a look. <laughs> okay. Surprise! Alice? What is this? I guess I have a small confession to make. I thought maybe you could write here that a change of scenery would get you past- Damn it, Alice! You- Everyone Hey, keeps... hey, hey! Just hear me out! There's a local doctor, Dr. Hartman. I read a book of his. He has a private clinic here. He specializes in helping artists. Maybe so now you want to get me committed? No! It's not like that! That's not- Alan? Alan? I don't! Just don't! I don't want to hear it! God damn it, Alice! God damn it! I knew she wouldn't follow me in the dark. I needed some time alone to think things through. <sighs> damn it. We're out. Oh, no! from one nightmare and entered another. I couldn't remember how I got there, 
All I knew was that something terrible had happened to Alice. The phone was dead. I'd have to find help on foot. Among Alice's things was a book, The Creator's Dilemma, by a Dr. Emil Hartman. Seeing the book brought back my fight with Alice. I didn't like it, and I didn't like the guy's smug face on the cover either. The gas station was my best bet. They'd have a phone I could use. It looked like a long hike through the forest to get there. Someone there? The loose sheets of paper were pages from a manuscript entitled Departure. That was the name I planned to use for the next novel I had never gotten started. I was named the author. I hadn't written it. I couldn't remember writing it. In the scene on the page, the hero was attacked by an axe murderer in the woods at night. Departure by Alan Wake. The man turned to face me. His face was covered in shadows. It was hard to make him out in the darkness of the forest that surrounded us, but the axe he lifted was plain to see. It glistened with the blood of his victim. He grinned madly. The shadows were alive, distorting his features. It was a scene from a nightmare, but I was awake. I've been in an accident! The lights up ahead were a good sign. Maybe I wouldn't have to hike all the way down to the gas station to find a phone. took another sip of the heavenly coffee. He grinned at Rose. Surely this was love. Rose gushed on breathlessly. The new one will be a masterpiece, I know it. You must tell him not to listen to the trolls in the forum saying departure will never get finished. He should take his time and make it perfect. I can wait. Anybody there? Please, I've been in an accident. Hey, hey, you! 
failed. There's been an accident. I need help. Listen, I need to... Premium cabins for rent in... Nightfall! Oh, hell. Carl Stucky. Please. To beat you. Non-refundable reservation deposit required. Fair and square. Uh. Taken stood before me. It was impossible to focus on it, as if it stood in a blind spot caused by a brain tumor and eye disease. It was bleeding shadows like ink underwater, like a cloud of blood from a shark bite. I was terrified. I squeezed the flashlight like my life depended on it, willing it to stop coming any closer. Suddenly something gave, and the light seemed to shine brighter. dead. The office looked like my best bet. I could lock myself in. You lose? Shit. The deposit. It's the latest thing. Great. I had to figure a way out of this. Any second now and Stucky would be knocking on the door with his axe like Nicholson in The Shining. Bulldozer had gone over the cliff with the office. I hoped Stucky had suffered the same fate, but I wasn't planning on staying to find out.
never fired a gun outside a shooting range. And now I just killed someone or something. There were no bodies. They just disappeared. If I was dreaming, it felt real enough to make me sick. hand-painted graffiti was revealed by my flashlight. Someone had hidden a chest of supplies near it. The dark forest was the last place I wanted to go, but I had no choice. I had to get to the gas station. Rose knew she had been gushing, but right now, she didn't care. As far as she was concerned, her brief meeting with Alan Wake was literally the high point of her life. She watched as he got in the car with his wife. She was pretty, confident, at ease with Wake. Not like Rose. They were perfect for each other. She'd have given anything to be called their friend. When I saw the river below, something uncoiled itself inside my head. I realized that I'd have to find a way across. I didn't even want to look at the water. Barry Wheeler was bouncing off the walls. He jumped on a plane after his calls were ignored by both Al and Alice for several days. It could mean that they were both on a second honeymoon, but Barry didn't buy it. Al had been way too unstable for that, not sleeping, messed up. Barry had years of experience dealing with Alan Wake, and he couldn't ignore it. Something was wrong.
Stucky was still out there, in the dark, stalking me. For a long time, the dark presence had been weak, sleeping, nothing but a half-forgotten nightmare or a shadowy flicker in the corner of an eye in the forest at night. Not real enough to properly exist, and yet too evocative to fade away completely. Now it was waking up. The rider like a fly caught in a spider's web, each jerk and kick vibrating the strands that led deep into its lair. It was aware of him now, and it could use him. All he'd need was a little incentive. Taken. They're taken. The staircase was broken. I had to make my way up some other way. There was no power. There was bound to be a generator somewhere at the logging site. this forestry equipment around, there had to be something I could use to reach the top. I 
heard them before I saw them, swooping down from the sky and screeching as they came. I spun around just as the cloud was upon me. For an instant, I stared into a hundred dead eyes, black pearls glittering in the darkness. I raised the flashlight and the swarm exploded like fireworks. Feathers burned, turned into ash. I couldn't hear my scream above theirs. was just outside for a breath of fresh air, and what a night. I, I know most of you are probably in your beds by now, but if you're still up and around, take a moment. Step outside for a spell and breathe in deep. Mm, the weather is absolutely still. The sky is crystal clear. It's like the forest is quietly breathing along with you. Do you listeners know I'm, I'm a night owl, and it's on nights like this I wish I wasn't cooped up in the studio. Makes an old man like me wish I could just roam wild. <laughs> but here I am, and don't keep you company all night long if I weren't. Uh, it looks like uh, I'm not the only one staying up late. Caller, you're on the air. Hey, Pat, it's Maurice Horton. Hello, Maurice. What are you up to? Well, I was just taking Toby on his walkies. Oh, isn't it beautiful out there? Sure, but Pat, the reason I called is that Toby heard something rustling in the undergrowth and took off after it, and I couldn't find it. Probably a rabbit. Toby loves rabbits. Well, sure. Anyway, I figured that, you know, if anyone runs into Toby, they could grab him. My number's on his collar. And Toby's a friendly dog? Oh, Toby loves people. Usually he comes back, but we, we were pretty far from home, and it sounds like he went pretty wild there. Great dog, but he's just too dumb for his own good. <laughs> well, Maurice, it's out there now. Hope Toby comes home soon. Yeah, thanks, Pat. You have a good night now. First, I kept finding the pages as if by accident. The book I couldn't remember was either a terrible and true prophecy or an act of creation that had rewritten the world. I began to hunt the pages feverishly, for they held the answer to the mystery. With it, I could save myself. With it, I could save Alice. The gas station was closer now. It's light welcoming in the darkness. Paul makes the best dogs in the street. Belly Burster is the best with no coat. Monster Dog is second best. The famous dog is...
I stepped into the gas station's garage. It was dark and quiet. The place was a mess. It looked like someone trashed the place or that there'd been some kind of fight. Light spilled into the room through an open door at the back, and I made my way toward it. Without any warning, I was blinded by a bright light. An old portable TV on the shelf had come alive by itself. Impossibly, I could see myself on the screen, talking like a madman. The cabin on Cauldron Lake? She asked. The sheriff looked at me suspiciously. The early morning light flooded through the office windows. I would probably never have gotten out of the woods alive without her help, but I couldn't tell her the truth of what I'd faced the previous night. She'd think I was lying or crazy. She'd lock me up and she wouldn't help me find Alice. <laughs> immortality on those who advance it to elevate all of mankind. Newton, Einstein, Sagan, princes among men. But the price for such a legacy is steep indeed. In Night Springs. Tonight's episode, A Quantum Suicide. If our lives are already written, it would take a courageous man to change the script. Having called a press conference, Dr. Barclay Colvin is about to demonstrate that very courage. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, I am Dr. Barclay Colvin, and I'm glad so many of you could join me here at the Moorcock Institute. Tonight, I'm going to give a practical demonstration of the many worlds interpretation. As you can see, this is a loaded 9mm pistol. It shall be part of a thought experiment. And now, a real experiment. Known as a quantum suicide. Did he say suicide? Is that a real gun? He's kidding, right? Uh, please, please, stay calm. There is no risk. Observe what occurs when I place the weapon against my own forehead. 
Now, you might think this round is merely a dud. Not so. Observe the flower pot. And yet, I myself cannot be harmed with this gun. With each pull of the trigger, two new realities branch off. One in which the weapon didn't fire, and one where it did. With my machine here, I have ensured that this reality is always the former. I have bestowed upon myself quantum immortality. Under no circumstances can this gun kill me. Uh, so wait, wait, wait. What you're saying is that every time you pull the trigger, in another reality, you die? Yes, yes, of course, but that's completely trivial. There's an infinite number of things that could happen at any moment, and they always do happen somewhere. The point is, this one thing did not happen here. You're insane, Colvin. Insane? Insane? Hey, was this thing supposed to be plugged in? I stumbled on it. You fools! Gaze upon quantum immortality! Poor, poor Dr. Colvin. Filled by his own hubris or the ignorance of the masses. Perhaps he should have left the crate unopened, the decaying atom unobserved. Curiosity often kills the cat in night springs. body vanished, leaving behind only a lifetime of nightmares to come, assuming I'd reached the lights at the gas station alive. I recognized the parade float I had seen in Bright Falls when I first arrived with Alice. After the insanity I had just experienced in the darkness, the lights of the gas station felt comforting. At least for a moment, the sane world reasserted itself. Ducky spat on the garage floor and tried to shake the cobwebs from his head. Ever since the couple never showed to pick up the keys, things had been fuzzy. Something, a feeling caught his attention. Stucky looked up and stared as his brain tried in vain to process the horror before him. He stumbled back, knocking over a can of oil. 
A black pool spread across the floor while he struggled for a brief moment, then let go as the unrelenting darkness engulfed him. The deer fest had been two weeks away when we arrived. If the day count on the banner was right, I was missing a whole week between the night we got here and now. I had to get inside the gas station to find a phone to call for help. Toby knew the smell. It was the man the nice man who always gave him treats and never got tired of playing with him. Toby wagged his tail in excited anticipation and gave a joyous bark. Then there was another smell, a wrong smell, and it was alien enough to stop Toby in his tracks. Confused, he growled deep in his throat. The wrong smell came from the nice man. Blind animal terror pierced the dog's brain an instant before the ax followed suit. The garage was a mess. It looked like someone had trashed the place, or that there'd been some kind of fight. All right, I'll keep writing. Outside, there's only darkness. Outside the cabin, outside the story, there's only darkness. I can feel her presence in the dark. Just now, I could smell her perfume in the room. I'll reach her, I'll fix it up. I'll bring her back. The story will come true. If I stop, she's lost. I don't believe this. It'd been me on the TV, talking crazy. Was I losing my mind? Sheriff Station. Oh, thank God, Sheriff. Sheriff Sarah Breaker, you are... I'm Alan Wake, but listen, 
I was in a car crash. My wife, Alice, she's missing. Calm down, Mr. Wade. We were staying in a cabin on the island, on Cauldron Lake. There's no island on Cauldron Lake. Not since the big eruption in the 70s. Please, I can take you there, okay? You look like you've taken a pretty bad knock to the head. Are you okay? Listen. We'll figure this out. Please get in the car. We'll swing by the lake, and then we'll go to the station, okay? Mr. Wake, have you seen Stucky, the guy who owns this place? I realized I couldn't tell her what had happened in the forest. She wouldn't have believed me. And then she wouldn't have helped me with Alice. Candy-colored clown, they call the Sandman Tiptoes to my room every night And just to sprinkle stardust and to whisper Go to sleep, everything is all right I close my eyes Then I drift away Into I softly say a silent prayer like dreamers do. Then I fall asleep to dream my dreams of you. In dreams, I walk. Previously on Alan Wake, I came to Bright Falls with my wife, Alice. Thank you for coming here with me. I thought maybe you could write here. I don't want to hear it. God damn it, Alice. Now, she's missing. Alice? <coughs> Alice? I woke up behind the wheel of a crashed car. I'm missing a week. I was attacked by shadowy men straight from a nightmare. The sheriff took me to the lake Alice and I had stayed at. But the cabin had disappeared. Hi, 
Honey, I'm home. Back here, sweetie. How was it? Worst weather I've ever seen. You should put some coffee on. It'll warm you up. Coffee's on. Great, thanks. I'll need it if I'm gonna finish this by tomorrow. Oh, hey, I just finished those cover mock-ups. They're on your desk. Tell me what you think. No kidding. I didn't think you'd get them done this quickly. On occasion, I can perform all sorts of miracles, my dear. Oh, really? Well, you seem to think so last night. Freezing rain and heavy snowfall have necessitated a winter storm warning in the entire tri-state area. People are advised to stay indoors as many roadways are already closed, and city officials are not expecting snow crews to keep up with the weather. We're now on the third day of the blizzard, and the weather is not expected to clear up anytime soon. true what they say about the fall and the sudden stop at the end. I'd lain here in the snow while the lurid chain of scenes that had led me here kept playing in my head. A rerun of my own private snuff movie. A memory of my corpse. Alone at my own wake. Thinking in metaphors again. The femme fatale was gone. Only a sour taste remained of the kiss that killed me. This was a late goodbye, 13 years after I'd gotten my revenge. It had finally caught up with me. It had been a long time to bear the pain. My blood painted the snow red, a gruesome slushy, dissolved all the scattered painkillers and leisurely dripped down to the sewer mingling with the bile of the city, becoming one with it. I can see them now. My wife and my baby. Honey, I'm home. These look really good. Oh, sure, until Barry gets his hands on them. Which, by the way, will happen over my dead body. The last time was the last time. Oh, and speaking of Barry, he called. <gasps> Alan! Alan, please check the fuse box. I'm right here. I'm on it, honey. Please hurry. I'm right here, baby. I'm fine. I'm fine. Just get the lights back on. Now, please. Honey, it's a power outage. I I've got the flashlight. Okay. Hi. You okay? I'm sorry. I just... It just really spooked me. Don't worry. We'll just break out the candles. I know it's stupid, but it's just... Especially when I'm not prepared for it, you know? It gets to me. I love you. Tell me a story, writer. Okay. <clears throat> I used to have these nightmares when I was a kid. The dark really spooked me, too. When it got really bad, my mom gave me this old light switch. She called it the clicker. The clicker, huh? Yeah. If I ever got scared of the dark, I could just flip the switch and a magic light would scare the monsters away. Oh, sure. Here it is. Alan. Maybe it'll help you, too. <laughs> yeah, nice story, writer boy. You made that up right now, didn't you? No, no. <laughs> Seriously. 
I love you, even if you are a liar. Thanks for this. you feel, Mr. Wake? Any nausea, disorientation, anything like that? Mr. Wake, how are you feeling? I'm okay. My head's fine. I had to lie about my headache and memory loss. He'd send me to a hospital for tests. I couldn't leave without Alice. Mm, very well. Um, I don't think you have a concussion, but you've obviously been through quite a shock. You should take it easy for a couple of days. Thanks. Well then, Mr. Wake, we're done here. If the pain gets any worse or you experience any other symptoms, you should come see me. I'll let you get on with it then. Sarah, uh, Sheriff Breaker, is waiting for you. She's very good at her job. I'm sure she can locate your wife in no time. Doc Nelson was the image of a small town doctor. Sheriff Breaker had called him to the station to take a look at the cut in my head. I'm sorry you had to cut your morning fishing short for this, Doc. Oh, she's a beauty, ain't she? Not the biggest I ever caught, if you can believe that coming from an old fisherman like me. But she's right up there. Now, she's a largemouth bass, which is what you're after if you prefer a lure. Now, if you want either trout or salmon, on the other hand, then it's fly fishing for you. Um, you a fishing man, Mr. Wake? Oh, doesn't really matter, I suppose. But it can be very relaxing out there. You can't get me off the water this time of year. Closest thing to heaven. I'll take your word for it, Doc. Thank you for testing the lights, Miss Weaver. Everything seems to be fine. I don't have the luxury of being complacent, Deputy Grant. The bulbs will need changing soon. You can't change them in the dark. I'll be sure to take care of it, Miss Weaver. Have a nice day now. Very good. I'll come back later on to remind you, just in case. Mr. Wake, the sheriff is waiting for you in her office down the corridor. That was Cynthia Weaver. I guess you can call her the town eccentric. She used to be the editor of the local newspaper, but she's focused on, um, well, other things these days. She'd fit right in where I come from. As you can see, she's a little obsessed with maintaining the light bulbs of the whole town, refuses to step on shadows, things like that. Back in her day, she wrote about all sorts of weird things in the paper. Bright Falls has a colorful history. Of course, what small town hasn't? Alice looked through the viewfinder, lining up the shot. Cauldron Lake was breathtaking. Something caught her eye, a figure standing in the shadows behind the cabin like a thin woman in a black dress. She lowered the camera and looked again. No one there. Just a collection of bushes that looked vaguely human-shaped. She shook her head and laughed. Yeah, it's uh, Mulligan here. I'm at Stucky's gas station with Thornton. There's no sign of him. Over. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, this is Thornton. Look, we've located the parade float. It's here. That's some good news, right? Stucky was supposed to be driving it at the rehearsal today. Over. Oh, give me that. Mulligan here. Looks like someone really thrashed the garage. Over. Okay, roger that, guys. Keep looking for Stucky. Jane's out. The sheriff wants to see you in her office, Mr. Wake.
Come in, Mr. Wake. Your phone's on the desk. The battery was dead. It's charged now. Have you started looking for my wife yet? My men are already on it. Now, can you tell me what happened? I'm not sure. I can't remember. We were arguing. I walked out of the cabin. The cabin on Cauldron Lake? How did you end up at Stucky's gas station? I wanted to tell her what had happened last night, but I couldn't. She'd lock me up. Excuse me. I need to take this. Hello? Alan, please help me. Alice? Stop talking to the law. You'll do exactly what I say if you ever want to see your wife Who again. is this? Go to the back lot. There's a hole in the fence on the left. Look inside the junker. I left a little something there to convince you we're all on the same page here. After you ditch the cops, you're gonna meet me in Elderwood National Park. There's a spot called Lover's Peak. Midnight. Don't do nothing stupid, pal. We're watching you. I need some fresh air. Can I go out? In the back, maybe? Of course, Mr. Wake. I understand. You can get there through the cells. Deputy Grant can show you the way. I'm sorry. All of this, it's just a lot to take in. Take your time, Mr. Wake. I understand. Can I ask you what the call was about, Mr. Wake? It's personal. <laughs> well, we are looking for your wife, and I'm going to need your cooperation if I'm going to help you. I need a moment, after I get some fresh air. Okay. You can find me here. We'll talk when you feel up to it. Mr. Wake, can I help you with anything? I need to get some air. The sheriff said I could go out back. Of course, Mr. Wake. You can get there through the cell corridor. Just don't mind Walter in there. He's one of our regulars. I thought he quit drinking for good. Oh, no such luck. He went on a bender and beat Danny pretty badly. He started shouting like that the moment he woke up. The parking lot is through that door and down the corridor. Pay no attention to Walter Snyder on your way. Just go through the door there and past the cells. The door at the end of the corridor leads to the back lot, Mr. Wake. Right. Thanks. I know Walter. He sounds really bad. I'll keep an eye on him, but I think the only thing wrong with him is that he's a mean drunk. And there's no medicine for that. Hey! Hey, mister! Hey, can you turn the light? The light's on! The deputies, they won't... they don't understand. They won't listen to me. I... I need it to be bright in here! You're all right. You're a good guy. Don't let anybody tell you different. You know I shouldn't even be in here? The cops, they got it all wrong. See, sure, 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 I beat him up, but I wasn't drunk. I mean, I wasn't drunk at the time. I only got drunk afterward. Okay, listen. Listen, listen, you gotta listen carefully now. Here's the kicker. That wasn't Danny. No, sir. It only looked like him. You wanna know who it really was? I tell you who it really was. It was a goddamn space alien! I know it sounds like something a drunk would say, but believe me, I wasn't drunk then. you do that for? You're with them, aren't you? You were those space aliens. You think you got me right where you want? Will you just wait? You just wait. Uh, I told him oh, yeah, well, I don't hear yes. We're on your feet. I uh, 
In spite of its human mask, to describe the dark presence as intelligent would have implied human qualities on something decidedly inhuman. Nonetheless, it found the one spot in the diner that was dark enough. Some light spilled into the corridor, ravaging it, but it took the pain. Horrible as it was, the writer would soon fix that. He would be coming to the one place where it still had power. The early morning light hurt my eyes and made my head ache. The man on the phone had said, go through the fence on the left. Well, folks, it's been another long night, and uh, it's about time for me to sign off for a while. God knows I need my beauty sleep. <laughs> uh, just one more item before I go. It's been a busy night for the sheriff's department. We've had a few broken windows, even a report of shots fired on Main Street. Deputies Mulligan and Thornton had to deal with two intoxicated young men who were celebrating the completion of their Deer Fest float. Now, folks, we get this every year. I know it's exciting that the big day is almost here, but let's save it for the party and leave the gunplay for the shooting competition, huh? There's no point in getting all worked up yet. The caller had told me to find a hole in the fence behind the police station. There was something for me in an abandoned car. The kidnapper fired his gun one last time and the shadow vanished into the darkness it had come from. See? Nothing to it, Wake. The thought of Alice in his hands was revolting. We stood on the wooden platform of Lover's Peak, the waterfall and the mountain behind us, the lights of the radio mast blinking red in the heights above. I fought with the urge to take a swing, force myself to speak. Let's cut the act now. Where's my wife? Alice's driver's license had been placed on the front seat. The caller meant business. Barry? Ow! Ow! Thank God! Where the hell have you been? I've been trying to reach you for a week, you and Alice. Oh, I've been worried sick. I flew out yesterday. I'm here, here in Bright Falls. Barry, listen to me. I'm at the sheriff's station. Come and get me. I can't talk now. Ow! What the hell is going on? I had to get the sheriff to let me go. I needed to get to Elderwood National Park to meet Alice's kidnappers. A writer is a light that reveals the world of his story from darkness, shapes it from nothingness, the way a sculptor carves a statue from a block of granite. If I stop, the world I'm making dies. Darkness will reclaim it. It's a long, hard journey into the dark. Alice's life is at stake, but I can't think about that or I'll lose it. The dread lingers at the edge of perception. I'll push on, anything is possible here. I'll write the story, I'll save her. Marvelous, Sarah. I just wanted to settle all the damage the Anderson brothers might have inadvertently caused on their recent and regrettable little outing. They are not accountable for their actions, of course. I can assure you that my staff has been reprimanded. Tor and Odin never caused any trouble to anyone when they were still living at their farm. Indeed. All we can do is to slow down the progress of their dementia. Are you feeling any better, Mr. Wake? I'd like to leave. Am I free to go? Well, we still need to talk about... Am I under arrest? No, of course not. 
But I need to know where you'll be staying so I can get in touch with you. I'd avoid the motel. The Majestic is known for its roaches. The cabins at Elderwood are pretty nice, though. That sounds perfect. I'm Dr. Emile Hartman. I'd like to invite you to stay at Cauldron Lake Lodge. Did you talk to my wife? I had the pleasure of discussing your situation with her on several occasions. Did you set something up with her? I invited her here. My clinic is a place where... Oh! Hey! Oh, my! Take it easy. Nobody move! Get your hands off of my client! Who are you? I'm Barry Wheeler, his agent. If you have business with Mr. Wake, you talk to me. You yokels won't know what hit you once I sick my lawyers on your asses. No harm done, Sarah. I'm all right. I don't want to press charges. Mr. Wake, my offer still stands. Get me out of here. What the hell was that about, Al? We don't need a replay of that thing with the paparazzi. I thought they were gonna lock you up. I had to talk to someone. I told Barry everything. He thought I was certifiable, but when he heard about the manuscript, I had him. The fact that I'd written something, even if I couldn't remember it, was enough for him. He smelled money, and he believed that Alice had been kidnapped. Anything beyond that was another story. I had a midnight appointment with the kidnapper in a place called Lover's Peak, somewhere in Elderwood National Park. The plan was to rent a cabin. I don't like it, Al. I don't like any of it. It's not good. In fact, it's the absolute opposite of good. Mr. Wake! Barry, you found him! Hi, Rose. Oh, wow. I was just thinking about you, too. Great. I was just bringing Rusty some coffee. He's on the balcony, looking after Max. Poor thing. I really need to go. Great to see you again, Mr. Wake. Later! Who's Max? What an airhead. Jeez, Mr. Takes a Swing at everybody. This is not her fault. She's a very nice girl and, more importantly, a fan. She even has a fan site dedicated to you. And she was very helpful when I was looking for you. Seriously, Al, what you were saying in the car? Just listen to yourself. What, you shot a guy and his body just disappeared? When was the last time you slept? What, are you high? Have you been drinking? No. Look, Barry, I'm missing a week. And someone's got Alice. Do you and understand just... what it sounds like when you say stuff like that? Don't get me wrong. It's a good story. Could be a bestseller. But when you start confusing fiction with reality... You're buying yourself a ticket to the funny farm. Right, wait here. Easy there, boy. I'm almost done. Hey, Rusty, right? You rent cabins. Oh, Mr. Wake. I'd shake your hand, but mine are kind of full here. Actually, I'm sorry about this. Would you mind grabbing the registration form from the desk? It's just across from Bucktooth Charlie. Okay, sure. What happened? Crazy poachers. Max here got his foot caught in a trap. They're illegal to use here. Hell, you're not supposed to hunt within the park at all. But that doesn't stop some lowlifes. <sighs> well, at least Max is gonna be okay. He got lucky. 
Max is still groggy from the shot I gave him, and I'd rather not leave him alone just yet. The form's on the desk across from the mammoth skeleton. Okay, boy. We're almost done. Seriously, Al, you can't just go and meet a kidnapper. Those situations always end up in disaster. You gotta talk to the cops. She's my wife, and it's my call. Can we talk about this later? No. This whole thing, it... Listen, you hit your head. I mean, geez, Al, come on. You gotta understand how crazy all this sounds. If you're trying to pull a joke on me, freak me out, it's working. Ha-ha, <laughs> let's have a laugh on Barry. Well, you had me going there real funny, Al. You can quit it now. I think this is the form you wanted. And here are the keys. Okay, you're all set, Mr. Wake. Glad to have you staying here. Thanks. Can you tell me how to get to Lover's Peak? <laughs> oh, sure. It's at the end of the nature trail. Just follow the paths, you'll get to it eventually. It's an easy walk. Nice spot, too. If you have any trouble finding it, just keep your eyes on the radio mast. It's right below that. Oh, and hey, if you take a walk in the woods, watch your step so you don't end up like Max. I guess I'm a little worried. We got a bunch of campers out there we haven't heard from. It's not like these people are on a schedule, but with the traps, well, you know. I just don't want any trouble. Right, thanks. Look, Al, you're asking me to believe that you shot a dude who went poof! into thin air, a guy who was bulletproof until you pointed a flashlight at him. You hear that from people who end up spending time in padded rooms, strapped to their beds, wearing white shirts with two long tangled up sleeves, and eating a healthy diet of pills. Al, you make cruel jokes about people who believe that kind of stuff. You're the skeptic. You gave me an hour-long lecture on homeopathy last month. What was it? If there's no proof, it's pure bullshit. Period. Guess the laugh's on me, then. Al, come on! I mean, okay. Okay, maybe something weird happened to you, okay? Well, thanks for the heartfelt vote of confidence. All I'm saying is you gotta throw me a bone here, bestseller. What would you think if it was me? There's no way you should be going out at midnight with a gun. No one asked you to come here, Barry. Either work with me on this or go straight back to New York. Your choice. Uh -huh. well, that's just crazy talk, Al. Al! Al? We should go to the sheriff or call the FBI? Damn it, Barry! They'll kill her! This is not a goddamn debate, Barry. I'm going to Lover's Peak. He said to come alone. Okay, okay then. I understand. But you're my best friend, and I'm worried that you're not right in the head. Tell me what to do to help, and I'll do it. You stay here, and if I'm not back by morning, call the cavalry. Just be careful with the natives, Al. These yokels are dangerous. Everybody hates a tourist, or it'll be deliverance all over again. Achoo! Bless you. Oh, this place is trying to kill me. I'll bet there's mold in here, spores, poison ivy, God knows what. This is so not worth a 15% commission. You want to know where you can shove that flashlight? Lock the door when I leave. Yeah, yep, yeah, you go ahead and do what you have to do. I'll be fine. Alone, but fine. In a cabin straight from a horror movie. What were you point that thing, Al? <laughs> Stop it, Al! Stop it! You're giving me a migraine, Al. You know I'm useless with a migraine.
Real funny, Al. Real funny. Ha <laughs> ha! Thank you! I'll just sit here in the dark till you come back. Or until I get eaten by a Gru. down the fort. I'll be with you in spirit every step of the way, Al. Lock me the door now. Barry had never gotten along with Alice, but he knew Alan loved her with an almost frightening intensity. And now something had happened to Alice. And here was Al armed with a gun and saying things people got put in padded cells for. It was as if his friend had experienced a massive psychotic episode and was now totally disconnected from reality. It scared the shit out of Barry. Barry had the keys to the car he rented. It wasn't a long walk to the visitor center and it wouldn't be any use to me in the forest. I knew I should have gone to the cops. This wasn't the smartest thing I'd ever done, but I was still angry with Barry for trying to talk me out of it. These people had called me right in the sheriff's station. The cops wouldn't scare them, and they had Alice. Welcome back to the show, folks. As promised, our very own Dr. Nelson has just parked his rear end in the studio. Doc, what's your Deerfest plan like? My plan? Well, you make it sound a lot more organized than I ever seem to manage. <laughs> no plan, really. Just taking the atmosphere. I'm getting a little too rickety to do much more than that, you know. Oh, tell me about it. No sack race for us older gentlemen, huh? <laughs> yes, exactly that. But I'm gonna check out the parade, of course. And I'll be one of the pie contest judges, too. <laughs> uh, well, that takes a different kind of constitution. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's my kind of exercise. Now, Doc, seriously, you're in pretty good shape, though. You're the outdoors type. I, I know for a fact you're an avid fisherman. That's right. Matter of fact, just caught a heck of a largemouth bass early this morning. But you're not taking part in the fishing contest? No, no, not this year. Um, see, Pat, I'm just not that competitive anymore. Now I just like to take my time and enjoy the peace of it. It's no fun if I need to worry about what I'm catching, you know? Well, considering your track record, the participants are probably pretty happy you feel that way. <laughs> well, Pat, that's kind of you to say.
crime and punishment. The cancer and cure of civilization. But some crimes are impossible to punish, especially in Night Springs. Tonight's episode, The Man in the Mirror. He's inside, Agent. He's a weird one. So, you're confessing to killing that guy, huh? Why? And it coming? Yeah, but why would you do that? I mean, you're a nice guy. Normal. Took a kid to a soccer game. So how come at the game, you pick a guy and, quoting from the arresting officer's report here, assault the victim's head area repeatedly with the weapon of choice being a pair of bare fists? Wow, that sentence really flows, huh? Maybe you're not the literary type. Okay, so you mess him up. But why? Who was that guy? We couldn't ID him. Why would a guy like you do him like that? I didn't like his face. Well, you must have hated it, because you really went to town there. I mean, there's no way to tell what he looked like. No ID on him either. That must be difficult. But then we ran the fingerprints. Got a match. Your prints. Identical. Huh, how about that? Your son said you were wearing a white shirt when you took him to the game. But the white shirt is on the dead guy. It's plenty red now. You won't get away with this. Do you really think that's in any way relevant to me? I had plenty of time to talk to my boy before the cops arrived, you know? He won't stop screaming, am I right? You think he's ever gonna be okay? <laughs> I left my mark. Believe me. You, you bastard. You gonna shoot me? What's the point? I'm going to prison. You got me. I... I don't understand any of this. And you never will. Don't worry. Maybe you'll see me again, Agent. Maybe in the mirror. Rose knew that Rusty was in love with her, and she liked him too. She liked him a lot. He taught her to dance, and life had certainly taught her the value of a man who was gentle. He treated her well, made her smile, made her feel good. But Rusty wasn't the prince of her dreams, and that tended to underline the unbearable truth. She was no closer to that Hollywood magic than he was. visitor center was heavy with an awful smell, as if some rotten, drowned thing had crawled up from its grave. Rusty kept coughing blood. My eyes were drawn to the twisted shape of his broken leg. The attack had been vicious. Max whined in his cage. Rusty's eyes were wild with fear and terror. He gasped. Mr. Wake, it happened just the way it was on that page.
vision left me weak. This was no head injury. the way it was on that page. I found. Came true. It knew. So dark. It'll come back for me. You must... The lights. In the office. I have the key. Okay, Rusty. Hang on. I'll be right back. Whatever did this couldn't be far. Rusty had found a page from the manuscript. It would help me understand what had happened. The only way to make sure that Rusty was safe was to get the power running and the lights back on. The gate to Lover's Peak was locked. The visitor center was sturdy, but the impact turned the front of the building into splinters. Rusty was thrown across the lobby like a rag doll and hit the far wall hard. It didn't hurt until he tried to move and saw his leg bend the wrong way, felt the broken rib stabbing him on the inside. Rusty howled in pain and fear, suddenly afraid to die alone. At the last instant, I changed direction and threw myself down. The axe splintered the trunk of a tree. I stumbled into the pool of bright light. My lungs burned. I was too exhausted to move. I tensed as I waited for the killing blow, but it never came. I raised my head. Nothing moved in the darkness beyond. For the moment, bathed in the cold light, I was safe. Too late. Someone had destroyed the circuit breaker. There was no way to get the lights back on. Rusty! The ground was covered with oily patches that looked like liquid darkness.
Something had torn a mammoth-sized hole in the wall. Please don't feed the animals. Fishing is only permitted for those prisoners who purchase a park license. Obey. Forget about it, Barry. It's just me going crazy. Oh, jeez. Oh, jeez. You're not crazy. I wish you were crazy, but you're not crazy. Ow, be careful. Stay in the cabin. Don't open the door for anyone. I mean it. In that last instant of consciousness, Rusty thought about Rose. He was older than she was. Rose was barely out of her teens, but she made him feel young and forget what a train wreck his long dead marriage had been. He still wore the ring. He'd been waiting for her to tell him to take it off. Now she never would. Lover's Peak was at the far end of the nature trail.
Gonzalez. Nobody in Bright Falls seemed to know where Al was, but Rose, the waitress at the diner, had seen him. From what Barry could tell, Al pretty much fell off the face of the earth when he left the diner. Rose was just the kind of fan that Al hated, but she really tried to help. She was smart, too, knew a lot about what was going on in the town, knew a lot about Al, even knew who Barry was. Barry liked her. That was no big surprise. When it came to women, Barry and Al rarely saw eye to eye.
I turned the corner, afraid of what the flashlight's beam might reveal. Suddenly, a roughly painted symbol of a torch glowed in the light. Behind it, hidden by a rock, sat a battered metal trunk. It was here for a reason, packed with supplies, batteries, flares, ammo, things you need to make it through the darkness of the night. Something left behind by someone who knew what I knew, and more. Agent Nightingale didn't want to be in Bright Falls. These little communities revolted him, and he didn't like the trees or the coffee. He now knew that impossible horrors lurked behind the storefronts and smiles. He desperately wanted to turn the car around and just drive until he passed out or ran out of road and booze. But he had a job to do. He had a rider to catch, at any cost. Coming. 
That flashlight's kid stuff. The flares will keep the bastards away. You can see them too? Hell, of course I see them. Come on, we gotta move. Why? <laughs> because that's the way the story goes. Yeah, but... Let's move! I lost my gun back there. Oh, I've got a gun. Just keep that light steady on him. It took a moment, but then I recognized him. He'd been on the ferry when I first arrived here with Alice. He knew my name. We were headed in the direction of Lover's Peak. There was no way this was a coincidence. He was the kidnapper. Come on, Wake. You better keep up. Lover's Peak, right up these stairs, Wake. Use the flares from the emergency box to hold them off while I get these boards off. Give me the gun. Yeah, <laughs> no can do, Wake. Are you kidding? Give me the gun! No time for back talk. Hold them off, damn it! Feeling better now, Wake. All cozy and safe. Better get ready. They'll be on us soon. This is it, Wake. The last stand. There's more players here. Get ready. We fight them as long as they keep coming. Give me the goddamn gun! They're coming! That's not how this goes. Get with the program, Wake.
Let's cut the act now. Where's my wife? I knew you were going to say that. I read it all before. You're a hell of a writer. Congratulations. You're going to bring about something glorious and terrible once we get you some uh, proper editorial control. What the hell are you talking about? Where's Alice? I want the entire manuscript, or she's going to suffer bad. You touch her all. <laughs> <laughs> because he thought it held some magical power. But I had no manuscript to give him. I had to get back to Barry and figure out my next move. On more than one occasion, Alice had tried to explain to me how it felt to be afraid of the dark. To her, darkness wasn't simply the absence of light, but something more tangible than that. It was something you could touch and feel. Worse than that, it was something with a mind of its own, something malicious and malign. For her, things changed when they were wrapped in darkness. They turned into something else, something foreign, and nothing was safe or innocent anymore. I'd never really understood what she meant, until now. Sarah didn't care about the legal threats Wake's agent had made. She let Wake go without argument, because there was something about him she couldn't quite put her finger on, something that reminded her of her father. She didn't think Wake would hurt his wife. Then she thought about the way he waded into Hartman, that hair-trigger rage flaring up without warning.
The night had been one desperate situation after another. I was exhausted, and my body felt as though it had been chewed up and spat out. The flashlight was heavy in my hand, and each pull of the trigger sent a painful shock up my arm. But I was finally out of the woods, and things were looking up. That's when I heard the chainsaw. I had heard the plane fall. It made no sense. It was clear that it had just fallen here, but it was very old and obviously hadn't flown in decades. Looking at it sent a shiver down my spine.
The logging site was a mess. The modular office had been pushed off the cliff. Deputy Thornton climbed up from the wreckage excited, breathing hard from the exertion. Nobody there. It's weird. Don't you think that's weird? Bored, Mulligan let out a mighty snort. Hell, it's always weird, Thornton. Just a question of sorting out what kind of weird it is this time around. saw the darkness attack the visitor center, it made him a believer. The men Al said he'd shot, they hadn't been just locals on crank. Somehow the world had changed, like the channel had been switched without warning. You think you're watching a sitcom and you're really watching a horror show. When the birds started attacking the cabin, Barry wasn't surprised, just terrified. Shadows stirred and the wind picked up as I ran through the forest. I felt the dark presence turning its gaze toward me. Then the moonlight was blotted out by dark shadows that raced violently across the ground, moving too swiftly to be natural. Darkness gathered between the trees and melted again to reveal the Taken. No natural path had brought them here.
I still had to reach Barry at the cabin, but at least I was out of the woods. I'd have to get the car from the locked garage. It would get me back to Barry faster and the headlights were a welcome bonus. The FBI agent's command froze me in place. I considered surrender. It was all falling apart anyway. I could give in. Let someone else deal with it. But it felt all wrong. Cold instinct. His posture. The way he held the gun. He was no friend. Shots ringing in my ears, I leaped for the hole in the fence and stumbled into the darkness beyond. to find the key to the garage. A story is not a machine that does what you tell it. A story is a beast with a life of its own. You can create it, shape it, but as the story grows, it starts wanting things of its own. Change one thing and you set off a chain reaction of events that spreads through the whole thing. The characters have to be true to themselves. The events need to follow a logic that fits the story. A single flaw and the magic is gone. The story dies. Alice dies.
there was no misunderstanding. Cauldron Lake was where Alice and I had stayed, but there was no cabin and no island. I was missing a week. What had happened to me? What had happened to Alice? I had to get her back. I couldn't face life without her. weapon I could imagine against the dark things I was facing. It was the kidnapper. You son of a bitch! Where's my wife? Enough horseplay, Wake! You deliver the manuscript, and you can have your woman back. Simple as that. I don't... Listen. Listen. I'm gonna need time to finish it. I still need to write the ending. I need... a week. It's not done? I need a week. Two days! The old Bright Falls coal mine is nearby. You can find it easy, city boy. The main building, there at noon. You bring the manuscript, you get your wife. If not, well, uh, get me. Yes, yes, I, I get you. The dark presence had touched the girl to lure the writer into a trap. Now it was night, and he lay helpless, drugged, lit only by the flickering of the TV screen filled with static. Shadows coalesced in the room as the Dark Presence leaned close to the writer, ready to touch him again. Back to work, boy. Barry had talked about birds over the phone.
open the door now. They're gone. Hey, Al. I'm... I'm sorry for thinking you were having a psychotic episode, man. I sent Barry to the town to ask around about a man fitting the kidnapper's description. He'd go through the archives of the local paper. Perhaps he could learn something. Anything about the island and the cabin that had disappeared. The man wanted a manuscript. I had to try to write him one to get Alice back. For me, the supernatural had always been nothing but a metaphor for the human psyche, a tool to use in writing fiction. Now, it was happening for real, and I couldn't put a single word on paper. Barry Wheeler speaking. This is Rose. Rose? I found Mr. Wake's pages. Oh, you sweet, brilliant girl. Could you and Mr. Wake come get them? I live in the trailer park outside the town. We'll be there in less than an hour. Bye now. See you soon. Have a great day. Hope you come back soon. Welcome, Welcome to, to the Old Deer Diner. Good girl.
Previously on Alan Wake, Alice has been kidnapped. Alan, please help me. Alice? You'll do exactly what I say if you ever want to see your wife again. I can't tell anyone except my agent, Barry. Damn it, Barry, they'll kill her. You're my best friend, and I'm worried that you're not right in the head. The ransom is a manuscript I supposedly wrote that's coming true before my eyes. It happened just the way it was on that page. So dark. I have found only a few scattered pages. I want the entire manuscript. The deadline ah. is in two days. I found Mr. Wake's pages. Good girl. How the hell did she get her hands on the manuscript anyway? I don't know. She's resourceful. I told you you were too hard on her. Listen, I found out all sorts of interesting stuff while I was digging around. Yeah. Mr. Wake, it's Sheriff Breaker. We have an FBI agent here, Agent Nightingale. FBI? He's anxious to see you. You'd better come to the station. Okay, I'll be right over, Sheriff. Let's make this quick, huh? Help you folks? Name's Randolph. I'm the manager. We're looking for Rose. Works as a waitress down at the diner. Rose, sure. Nice girl. Who wants to know? I'm Alan Wake. The writer, huh? I heard on the radio you were visiting. Well, I'll show you her trailer. That Rose, she's a nice girl. Always pays her rent on time. As I was saying, Al, I found all sorts of weird stuff from the local newspaper's archives. This place is crazy. Disappearances, mysterious deaths, urban legends come true, and get this, most of this stuff takes place around Cauldron Lake. Well, you ain't wrong, mister. The Indians thought the lake was a doorway to the underworld. I'm the God-fearing type myself. I, I don't hold with that sort of thing. Yeah, okay. Anyway, there was an island there owned by a guy called Thomas Zane. Now, some of the articles I found about him make him out to be a famous writer, but I ran a bunch of searches, couldn't find a single thing he wrote. Zane was heavily into diving, so much so that the place came to be called Diver's Isle. But the volcano under the lake erupted in 1970, and Zane went down with the island. Yeah, how about that? It was there in the morning, as if it had fallen from the sky. But it would take a tornado to lift something like that. We're damn lucky it didn't crush any of the trailers. Come on, mister. I'll take you to Rose's trailer. Just follow me. It's not far. gets better. A local girl, Barbara Jagger, drowned in Cauldron Lake just a week earlier. They were lovers. Sure, Jagger's a local spook store. The scratching hag comes for you in the dark. Childish stuff like that. Anyway, Al, I'm just getting to the best part. All of the articles about this stuff were written by Cynthia Weaver. I asked around, and she's that crazy bag lady you met. What, the lamp lady? She can be a little loopy, but she's not homeless or anything. Yeah, anyway, she knew both Jagger and Zane before they both died, and she had some kind of a breakdown. Well, mister, this here's Rose's trailer. You mind me asking what you want with her? We're just here to talk to her, pal. Welcome to... 
to... Oh dear, Mr. Wake, I'm... I'm so glad you're here. Rose, you have my manuscript? Oh. Oh yes. Yes. Please, come in. Hey, this is really good! Rose. Yes? My manuscript. I really need it. I understand. I know what you need. A muse to inspire you. Oh, for Barry? She doesn't have anything. Yeah, uh, hey Al? Al, what's... Oh. Barry! What? What? coming for you, hiding in my barber's skin. I'm too weak to stop it. You must turn the lights on. I promised I'd come visit you and your lovely wife. You must finish what you started. I insist. You must turn the lights on. I felt nauseous, hung over. Only anger kept me going. I can't tell reality from dream anymore, but it seems I have an imaginary editor to help me. She's an old woman in a funeral dress. I call her Barbara Jagger. She's very strict. I I'm writing faster and faster. My manuscript is being heavily revised. The edits are getting very aggressive, and each day there's less of me and more of her. I hate it, but I know she's right. She promises me I can save Alice this way. She knows more of this than I do, about the complex incantation I'm attempting, about this place. She's worked with another writer under similar circumstances, Thomas Zane. The genre of the story seems to be shifting. It's turning into a horror story. I'm getting close. I can feel it. Rose took a day from me. I had less than 12 hours left to meet the kidnapper. All I could do was get Barry into the car, work something out once I got on the road. Barry was out of it. He was way too heavy to carry. You're right. I deserve more money. I'm so handsome. Welcome to the Oh Dear Diner. What can I get you today? Coffee. I couldn't work up much hate for Rose. Something had used her to get to me and left its mark. First refill is free. Milk and sugar on the counter there. Would you like to hear today's specials? Thank you. A nice day. Come back soon. My gun and flashlight were gone. I'd have to find a way to get Barry into the car as quickly as possible. There was no time to waste. Mr. Randolph liked Rose. That little smile she had. How she was still sweet when life had tried so hard to make her bitter. It wasn't any of his business what she did in her trailer. But those strangers, the writer and his smart-ass sidekick, looked like trouble and they'd been in there for hours, way past her normal bedtime. He reached for the phone and called the sheriff's station. I just stepped outside to catch a breath of fresh air. Let me tell you, the weather's getting heavy. 
Nights like this make me especially glad I'm here talking to you and not home in bed. Once, once the weather takes a turn like this, I can't sleep at all. It's all tangled bed sheets and dark thoughts, punctuated by the occasional plunge into nightmare. <laughs> is it just me? Well, perhaps it is. But I hope I can make the night a little bit easier to get through. Caller, you're on KBF FM. Hey, hi, it's Walt Snyder. What's on your mind, Walt? Well, I ain't the way you are, but, well, uh, I can't sleep either, you know? Uh, I've just been staring out the window here, trying to make sense of it all, but, uh, I ain't been drinking either, you know? I just... Well, you sound like a man with a problem, Walt. Something like that, Walt. Yeah. Well, you know, he's, uh, you know, Daddy's my best friend, and, uh, he let me on um, bail today. And now I'm just alone here at the window, you know, waiting. Man. And there's something in the air tonight, man. Uh, I was just outside looking up at the sky above our broadcast tower thinking the same thing. What are you waiting for, Walt? I don't know. I, you know, something's gonna happen. You know, I gotta, I gotta, I, I think I better go. Well, uh, Walt, uh, maybe... No, th thanks, Pat. Uh, well, good luck to you, Walt. Hang in there. Uh, let's take a little break, folks. This weather's really something else, huh? How can I be sure? You're gonna get it now. God knows what you've done to that poor girl. This is Agent Nightingale, FBI. Get him up, Hemingway. You're under arrest. You move a muscle, I'll unload right in your goddamn face. Stay right where you are, Slane. Standing right here, you goddamn maniac! I hated to leave Barry behind, but there was no way I'd miss my appointment with the kidnapper. For decades, the darkness that wore Barbara Jagger's skin slept fitfully in the dark place that was its home and prison. 
It was hungry and in pain. It dreamed of its nights of glory when the poet's writing had called it from the depths and given it a brief, terrible taste of power and freedom. The rock stars had stirred it from the deep sleep the poet had sunk it back to in the end. When it sensed the rider on the ferry, it opened its eyes. Rose didn't know how the strange old lady got in her trailer, and she looked wrong somehow. The woman showed her teeth in an approximation of a smile and traced a finger down Rose's cheek. Pretty girl, she said. Rose felt as if she was falling asleep, but her knees didn't buckle. The crone spoke in a whisper, her words ice cold and dark in Rose's ear. This horror was everywhere I went, circling me. The cops didn't stand a chance. They were after a writer, not a monster.
Thornton here. Uh, Gates, we got both Wheeler and Rose in custody. <laughs> they didn't put up a fight or anything. Why, they were... Hey, what are you doing? Come on! Sit down and give me that. Gates, Mulligan here. Over. Uh, go ahead, Mulligan. Over! Uh, we got Wheeler and Rose here. Wheeler's drunk or hopped up on something. Speaking of which, that Fed had a pretty distinctive whip of old scotch about him, if you know what I mean. Over. Uh, I don't have anything on that, Deputy Mulligan. Over. Well, whatever. Anyway, Rose is just being plain weird here. You better get Doc in to take a look at both. Over. Gotcha. You better get them here quickly. The, uh, Fed's gonna want to interview Wheeler. Over. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll bet he does. Looks like they have a lot in common. Mulligan out. <coughs> could see the lights at the radio station in the distance. I imagine that the broadcast tower in the distance was part of the local radio station. Maine seemed like a decent guy. Perhaps he could give me directions to the coal mine. Unnatural shadows clung to the gate. The darkness that was after me was trying to stop me. I wouldn't get through without the light. There was no power to the searchlight. generator conked out. I'd have to see if I could fix it and try again. It took me a moment to recognize the flashbang grenades. They were an ideal weapon for my situation. Team one, come in. Over. Team one, this is Sheriff Breaker. Report. Over. Team two, come in. I need a report. Over. Come on, guys. Talk to me. Come in, please. Over.
Touched by the dark presence, Rose was lost in a dreamland where everything was drawn in black and gray crayons. The old lady had promised her that all her wishes would come true. She would be Alan Wake's muse. She was smiling so hard it hurt her face. She crushed a bottle full of sleeping pills into the coffee. Deep down inside, she was screaming in terror. Maine could lend me a car to get to the coal mine. Hi, it's Lorna Miles. Why, hello, 
Lorna. What do you have for us? Well, I just don't see why the cops bother with the trailer park. What do you mean? It's a trailer park. Of course you're going to have trouble in a place like that. I mean, what do you expect? The sheriff should be helping us normal citizens instead of wasting resources on those people. Well... Let the trash sort themselves out. I'm sorry, but my granddaddy settled in Bright Falls in 1911. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, compassionate viewpoint, Lorna. How can I be sure? This writer, Alan Wake, just walked in. Folks, I'm going to see if I can talk him into an interview. Come on in, Mr. Wake. Uh, it, it looks like Mr. Wake is going to need a moment before we can talk, so uh, let me give you a little background while he prepares himself. You've all heard the name, of course. Alan Wake is the author of a very successful series of Alex Casey crime novels. He's changed gears, though. He's now working on a horror story. Now, you probably know that Mr. Wake is a somewhat controversial figure. He had a few ugly encounters with the paparazzi in recent years, although, speaking for myself, it's hard to blame him for that. Regular listeners will remember that I met him on the ferry last week. He's avoided the spotlight pretty well, but here he is, taking some time out of his vacation to talk to us. How can I be... Oh, I'm so glad you could find the time to do this, Mr. Wake. Nowhere to run now, Dan Brown! You back away from me! Don't hurt! Whoa, whoa, whoa. Everyone calm down. Put the gun down. We're all friends here, right? Cool your jets, Nightingale. We got him. Judas Priest! What the hell's the matter with you? There's a civilian in there! I had fallen off so many cliffs it was ridiculous. That's what you get for naming a book the sudden stop. It was probably good I hadn't had the chance to tell Maine where I was going. I'd have to lose the cops and find my own way to the mine. Nightingale stared through the broken studio window into the dark woods. He turned around, started to walk out, but Maine grabbed his arm. Young man, you almost shot me. You don't shoot off rounds at people like that. What's the matter with you? Nightingale shook his arm free, marched out. His cheeks burned with rage and humiliation.
had stepped out, but what stumbled back in was something else, something alien, a monster. Walter tried to kill it, first with his fists, then a chair. It wouldn't die. Instead, it kept coming, unaffected by the beating it had taken. After Walter managed to kick it down the cellar stairs, fear took over. He ran, got behind the wheel, gunned the engine. The booze wouldn't make him forget, but he knew he had to try. There was no sensible reason for the power company work lights to be here. It was almost as if they'd been left for someone like me to use.
The bulldozer's engine roared to life. Mud and rocks flew as it fought for traction. It crashed the concrete wall and landed heavily in the yard. If it were an animal, it would have shaken its head after the impact, fixed its eyes on me, and charged. Of course, it had no head, nor eyes. Shadows crawled on its form, twisting it into a monster. Then, it came for me. Sarah trusted her gut, and her gut said Agent Nightingale was an asshole. He felt wrong, and it wasn't just the smell of stale booze. It was in the way he flashed his badge, pulled rank, the look in his eyes when he wanted answers. Where was Alan Wake? What was this about an accident? Where was his wife? And most importantly, why did she let Wake go? He wouldn't answer her questions. Federal business was all he'd say. Hello? The most stubborn man I've ever met. Alice? Alice? Alan. Alan. I'm so afraid. It keeps me in the dark. Please help me. I look at you, Alan, and it's not you. It's something else. Looking out from behind your eyes. Alice, I'm here. The connection had been terrible, but that wasn't the only thing that hadn't been right with the call. She sounded wrong somehow, but she had called me. The pipe wrenched itself loose from the bridge's steel framework. Wrapped in darkness, it floated in midair, twitching. For a moment, I didn't understand what I was looking at. The heavy object lurched at me with impossible force. I threw myself out of the way, but just barely. When I turned my flashlight on it, it shook in a dark rage before it flew at me again. I could see a railway bridge up ahead, and a warehouse of some sort on the opposite shore. I hoped I could find a car from there.
that was pursuing me was growing stronger, and it was taking over everything in its path. Even after all this time, hearing the Night Springs theme caused a surge of conflicting emotions in me. It'd been my first real writing gig. Barry had known a guy who knew a guy, and suddenly I'd been a semi-regular writer on the show. I'd always been ashamed of the job. Felt it was trash. I'd wanted to be an artist, a novelist. I'd been naive back then. It had taken a long time to learn to be proud of the work. I slammed the door shut right in his smug face. He pleaded for me to open the door. True to form, the asshole actually thought I would obey. I had no sympathy left, no guilt either, not for him. I took a moment to savor the scream. I bet I had a smile on my face. It was all that I had time for. The dark presence was inside the lodge with me. As a teenager, just started to get interested in writing, Stephen King had been a source of inspiration to me. I thought about all the inanimate objects that had come to life in his books. No one is safe in a good horror story, certainly not the protagonist. That's what makes them fun. This was anything but. The darkness could possess anything, and it was getting closer.
take the facts of our existence for granted, unaware that they are merely a thin veneer of desperate self-delusion covering a vast cosmos of madness and horror. All too often, the stars are right in Night Springs. Tonight's episode, A Family Occasion. Journalist Alvin Durlis' trip to study the local customs of an insular community in Night Springs has been less than successful. Until tonight. Well, I'm glad you changed your minds about this. Ancient customs, local mythology. My editor loves this kind of stuff. Well, Mr. Durlis, we don't want to feel like we're on exhibition. But you have demonstrated the seriousness of your intent. Oh, I am serious. Really, just do your thing. I'll stay out of your way and observe. Actually, I thought you could assist us. I'm afraid we are a man short. It would provide you with an intimate perspective. Could I really? Of course, Mr. Derlin. Well, I guess that's the least I... What would I have to do? Oh, here. Let me show you with a kiss. I, uh, I... <laughs> Darkness surged towards me, sucking everything loose from the ground into its depths, tugging at my clothes. I saw the flare the kidnapper had dropped and threw myself towards it just as I felt my feet leave the ground. The darkness embraced me with the force of a tornado. Somehow I managed to light the flare. The darkness roared and cast me away. I fell toward the dark waters of the lake far below.
never been this glad to see the sunrise. I had a couple of hours to get to the coal mine. The coal mine wasn't far now. Today, I would meet the kidnapper, and he would give me Alice. I wouldn't give him any other choice. A drowning man will clutch at a straw. Little by little, without realizing it, I'd come to believe that the story in the manuscript was coming true. The current of its narrative had taken me deeper and deeper into dark waters. Alice had been taken from me. Barry was probably in jail. I was a fugitive from the FBI. The whole world taken over by the dark presence was trying to destroy me. It all felt real, but it matched a textbook case of insanity. This is Pat Main, and you're listening to KBF-FM. Folks, I want to apologize for kind of abandoning you to that looping music track last night, but I was detained. You see, I encountered a big-shot G-man with an itchy trigger finger who could use a, a lesson in manners and a boot in the ass, not necessarily in that order either. Now, folks, I know I'm not being very informative here, and I apologize for that. I really should just keep quiet, but... I'm just so peeved right now, because some people just shouldn't be carrying badges. And I'm just glad that our Sheriff Breaker was there to straighten things out. And if someone I met last night is listening, let me just say, I'm sorry if my mouth got you in trouble. I'm pretty sure you're not the bad guy here. Godspeed, son. I hope you know what you're doing. Now, on a lighter note, I'll be talking to Dr. Nelson all morning. But first, a little music.
Welcome back to KBF FM. Hope you enjoyed that tune. Now, Doc, you were talking about life and finding that special someone, that soulmate. Well, you were talking about that. I was saying I don't buy it. Well, see, to me, that's strange, because I always pegged you as a hopeless romantic. <laughs> you got me there, Pat. But I think love's where you look for it. And you need to do a lot of looking, sure. But the idea that there's that one special person out there for you, and if you miss that chance, it's gone forever, and you're forever incomplete. I mean, isn't that depressing? Or childish, even? There's plenty of fish in the sea. <laughs> and apparently a fisherman has a fishing analogy for everything. But what you're saying, isn't that a little harsh? Well, no. What I am saying is that your potential for finding that connection isn't limited to what's essentially a chance encounter. How is that harsh? Yeah, well, I guess that's a nice thought, but let me say something personal here. Okay. Now, well, I, I don't disagree with you exactly, but I can't really fit that together with what I feel, what I, what I felt for someone, because she was the one. She was. And she... I let her drift away from me. Maybe I didn't put in the work, I don't know, but, well, since then, and it, it was a long time ago, but, but since then, there hasn't been anyone, not like her. And I'm not saying I dwell on her or haven't moved on. I like my life. I, I'm not living in the past, but I do miss the way she completed me. You can't argue with the heart, Pat. Uh, I'm sorry, folks. I had kind of a scary experience last night, and let's just say it's shaken a few things loose. For Mott, spying on the writer on the ferry had been a disappointment. His boss had made Wake Out to be something special, but Mott hadn't been impressed. He'd gotten a good long look at the wife, though, and he liked what he saw. Mott had fantasized about goading Wake into a fight, but it hadn't happened. Still, he'd get his chance to see if the writer had anything in him. He'd been promised as much. It was early. I was supposed to meet the kidnapper at noon in the main building. The coal mine was quiet. It was a museum now.
With Nightingale gone and the night wind blowing in through the broken studio window, Maine stared at Sarah. The sheriff looked away. Maine's voice shook with barely controlled anger. That boy's doing more drinking than thinking. I hope you know what you're doing, Sarah. He's got a sickness in his eyes. You take my word for it. He wants Wake for a reason, and it's not for anything good. I didn't want to go outside. Cops had to be looking for me. The noon sun turned the place into a sauna. The day dragged on. Different scenarios ran through my mind. Ways of how I'd torture the kidnapper to get Alice back, or the different horrible things he could have done to her. I imagined her dead. I had no way of knowing she was still alive. It was killing me. I was running on blind hope. It was all a waste of time. The bastard never showed up. Wake! Where the hell are you? Change of plans. You know where Mirror Peak is? It's a big mountain north of where you are. You follow the path from the mine, you can't miss it. There's a lookout point there. I'll be waiting. I'm through being jerked around you by you. You want to see your wife alive? Because if you do, you better watch what you say to me. Do we understand each other? I want to talk to Alice. Yeah, and I want the manuscript. Don't keep me waiting, Wake. Hello? Hello? Ah! I'm going to kill him. I had to get to Mirror Peak. Maybe closer than ever before. When Thomas Zane fell for Barbara Jagger, it happened fast. She was young, vibrant and beautiful, full of life. He had never been a very happy man, and without any seeming effort, she had changed all that. Zane felt good for the first time in his life. Everything she did was another piece of a jigsaw puzzle he hadn't even known he'd been missing. And best of all, she made the words flow, strong and sharp. She was his muse.
reach the hillside ahead was to go through the building. I had to find a way to avoid electrocution. Some of the Taken retained echoes of their former selves, but these were just the nerve twitches of a dead thing. Nothing remained but a shell covered and filled with darkness. In most cases, these puppets were enough for the purposes of the Dark Presence. But for anything more elaborate, as with the writer, it was different. It needed his mind. And so rather than taking him over completely, it merely touched him.
There was no way the flashbang grenades were standard power company equipment. I stared through the bars of the jail cell. Barry stood behind me, swaying on his feet, looking as ill as I felt. Agent Nightingale stood on the other side of the bars with Sheriff Breaker. Nightingale had a stack of manuscript pages in his hand. He seemed unhinged as he gloated. Well, I've got you now, Raymond Chandler. It's all here, all the evidence, including conspiracy to murder a federal agent. no real plan. I was going to give the kidnapper all the manuscript pages I had for Alice. If that wasn't enough, 
I'd hold him at gunpoint and make him talk. The dark presence was moving ahead of me in the same direction I was going. A cold feeling settled itself in the pit of my stomach. Was it going for Alice? I lifted the page in front of my eyes and read it. In it, I lifted the page in front of my eyes and read it. In it, I lifted the page in front of my eyes and read it. 
In it, I lifted the page in front of my eyes and read it. In it, I lifted the page in front of my eyes and read it. In it, I lifted the page in front of my eyes and read it. The place was dead, a ghost town. Had been for decades, maybe a century. Things were never as simple in real life as in fiction. I had lost count of the times I had wished there'd be a clear reason for my writer's block. Something to fight. Something to lash out on. There wasn't. I was filled with doubt. I was nothing like the hero in my books. Alex Casey had gone through his life with single-minded determination, never wavering from his goal. Even now, I was angry at myself. Angry at Alice. Angry at Barry. I was fumbling and I had no plan. Doc sat down heavily. He examined Barry and Rose. Barry was already recovering. Rose was another story. She was conscious, but she was barely present, almost delirious, disturbed, touched in the head, they used to say. It wasn't the first time Doc had seen someone in such a state, but it had been over 30 years. Doc poured himself a stiff drink. He hadn't forgotten a thing.
I needed a key for the door. Outside of riding is a struggle. I feel ill. I managed to make my way downstairs. There's a shoebox filled with books and papers by Thomas Zane. It's very hard to focus, but I managed to read some of it. He's a poet, and a good one. He writes of muses and creators summoning fabulous things from a magic lake, using his powers to shape the world of a realm of gods and dreams and demons, dark things that wait for a chance to slip through, wearing the flesh of men as disguise. Zane writes about himself, his girlfriend being taken over by a dark presence, about growing scared of the lake. Zane believes it's a mirror to the gaping void of darkness above, where some Lovecraftian presence lurks. I crawl back upstairs. I'll borrow these things from my story. They ring true. They fit. Kidnapper had sent me a text. The message was full of spelling errors and insults. It was telling me to hurry up.
night morning, the headache stabbed at my brain. The hunters were big, thick-set men, confident and at home in the woods. They were feeling good, running on beer, ghost stories, and camaraderie late into the night. It did them no good, as they were taken by the dark presence, sucked deep into a darkness far worse than any ghost story they ever told or heard. Even behind the closed doors and curtains of his grimy room at the Majestic, the local motel, Nightingale could feel the locals' eyes on him, the unrelenting pressure of their judgment. He forced it out of his mind. For all he knew, they could all be under Wake's spell already. You do what you have to do to get the job done. He took comfort from the bottle in his hand. Please, he thought. Just let me get through this. have to make my way up this mine shaft in order to go on. Maybe the machinery could help me with that.
Lightning flashed behind the windows of Cauldron Lake Lodge. Tor Anderson laughed and held the steel hammer above his head. Nurse Sinclair was trying to calm him down without success. Tor grinned madly and shouted, My hammer's up. Here's a friendly poke from Mulnir, wench. He brought the hammer down with all his might on Sinclair's head. We're on a comeback tour, baby.
Maude had checked all of Stucky's rental cabins. There had been no sign of the wakes. It was dark when he'd found their car parked at the end of the road by Cauldron Lake. It made no sense. They must have taken a wrong turn, but there was no sign of them, and the car had been there for hours already. Frustrated, Mott stood on the rotten ruin of the footbridge that had once led to Diver's Isle before it sank beneath the waves years ago. The boss wouldn't be happy. see Cauldron Lake. I thought I could make out the spot where the island and the cabin had been. There was a light near it. It had to be a boat. I was close now. I had to get there fast. I dreaded what I would find. I tried to hold on to Alice but her form melted away. I was losing control. Dr. Hartman stood in her place. I wanted to hit him, but my arms were jelly. He smiled. It was a reassuring smile, and I hated him for it. I had to give you a sedative. Don't fight it. You went through another rough period. Right now, it's very important that you stay calm. 
We don't want you to have another episode. You're a patient at my clinic. Have been for a while now.
Previously on Alan Wake, I'm hunted by the law. Sheriff, Wake's running. I'm giving chase. Are you seriously telling me that writer just took out my deputies? A thriller I supposedly wrote is coming true. The genre of the story seems to be shifting. <sighs> it's turning into a horror story. I was told that Alice had been kidnapped, but that was a lie. We don't have his wife. We don't know where she is. Her purported <sighs> kidnapper was eaten up by the dark presence before it attacked me. to give you a sedative. Don't fight it. I... You went through another rough period. What? Right now, it's very important that you stay calm. We don't want you to have another episode. You're a patient at my clinic. Have been for a while now. The shock of your wife's death triggered a mental illness. No, you're... you lie. You're suffering from various Bastard. symptoms of undifferentiated schizophrenia. Bastard. It's okay, okay Alan. Alan. Just let go. I felt groggy. Whatever Hartman had bumped in me was making me numb. I felt like this was happening to someone else. Someone I was watching on television. I couldn't think. Couldn't focus. There were only empty sheets of paper here. No manuscript pages. The door was locked. I was a prisoner here. Good evening, Alan. Are we feeling better now? Feeling calm? Yeah. I see you brought your pet gorilla with you. So sure, I'm calm. I get the message, loud and clear. Quite right. That's the spirit? You're being very brave, Alan. I understand you're confused. I would be more concerned if you weren't suspicious of me. I don't blame you for it. Big of you. Now, why don't you come with me? We'll reacquaint you with my clinic and go over everything you might have forgotten. Little walk and some fresh air? Yes, it will do you good. This corridor is for patients. Most of them aren't here right now. Jack took them out for a fishing trip, except for the ones who are particularly vulnerable, of course. I encourage creativity as a part of the recovery process here at Cauldron Lake Lodge. I specialize in treating artists. I bet you do. Splendid, Alan. I honestly believe we can get this thing under control if we work together. This way, Alan. Now, Alan, from past experience with you, I know I need to get right into the heart of the matter as quickly as I can after an episode. So I'm just going to say this. Alice is dead. No. You're in a very vulnerable state until you understand and accept this. Alice drowned. And you couldn't face that. You're suffering from hallucinations, paranoid delusions, unusual thinking, an obsession about light and darkness, a feeling that everything revolves around you, your thoughts and dreams. Your mind has constructed an elaborate fantasy scenario in which your writings are affecting reality. She has been kidnapped and supernatural forces of darkness are trying to stop you. We go this way, Alan. I wasn't ready for another shot, so I went along with it. He had to be lying. But under the influence of the drug he had given me, I had to fight not to believe his words. It's all in your head. You've been making it up. Apart from the tragic accident with your wife, no one has been killed. Your delusions are just a manifestation of your subconscious mind 
trying to protect you from the too painful truth. Unless we fight the fantasy, it will return. I know the instinct is to resist me, but think about it. Doesn't this make far more sense than the insane supernatural conspiracy you have concocted in your mind? You're a skeptic by nature, Alan. We both know this. Everything can be explained logically. Never get tired of this view. Very inspiring, isn't it? Cauldron Lake spread below us. I could see Mira Peak on the other side of the lake. I thought I could make out the spot where Diver's Isle had been when I arrived with Alice. Now there was nothing but waves. It seems there's a storm coming. Funny, I don't recall there being a mention of that in the weather forecast. Well, no matter. This way. Follow me. Alan, what I'm telling you is good news. Right now we're in control. Every time you have a relapse, it gets more and more difficult to resurface from the dark depths of your imagination. Not surprising, considering your profession. Imagination is what you work with. After all your nightmares, this should come as an immense relief to you. If it doesn't, why is that? Because I'm lying? or because you don't want to admit that you're not well. It's very natural for you to think of me as your enemy. It's part of the I let him talk. After all, Hartman I'm obviously loved his own voice. His words echoed madly inside my head. But I, can't I dug my nails into the myself. palms of my hands to stay focused. You need to work with me. Once you accept that, we can begin the journey towards your recovery. Come along. Let's go inside. Now here's the entrance to the office wing. That's for staff only. You were impressed by my trophies when you first arrived here. I do love to hunt. The great outdoors, man versus nature. It's wonderful stuff. Pretty damn wonderful, yeah. Scary, scary, scary. <laughs> Emerson. I'm a real bad dream, mister. You should be afraid of me. Don't want to run into me in the night, that's for sure. Please, Emerson. Mr. Wake is confused enough as it is. Yeah, you'd like me to go away so you won't be scared. But you can't just decide what kind of dream you have or when you have it. Emerson. Okay, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Boo. That's Emerson. We're actually making some progress with him, I'm happy to say. He works on video games. It's ha! trash, of course, but it does I'll involve some small <laughs> creative effort, which makes him receptive to my therapeutic methods. No kidding. You might have noticed the typewriter in your room. You've been writing as a part of the therapy. As soon as you feel up to it, you should continue. My rheumatism is killing me. There's a storm coming! Oh, what a storm! I hope it wipes this place off the face of the earth. And these two are the Anderson brothers, Odin and Tor. They had a... how should I put this? A heavy metal band in the 70s and 80s called Old Gods of Asgard. 
They even adopted new first names to complete the image of Viking gods. After the band broke up, they lived on a farm nearby. They are, well, in advanced stages of dementia. They are well cared for, TLC and all that. There's nothing more that can be done. I'm afraid that the rock and roll lifestyle has left its mark. No, oh, that won't do. I'm so sorry to cut this short for now, Alan. The power has been acting up. I'd better go check on it. We'll continue this soon. Meanwhile, when you feel up to it, return to your room and try to write. It really is for the best. Don't you think? I'd like to bash his head in with a hammer. Oh, he'd love to fish out our secrets, but he has no clue. He's not crazy enough. <laughs> not crazy like us, Sonny. Yeah! Being ah. crazy's a requirement, Sonny. Who else could understand the world when it's like this? It takes crazy to know crazy. That's the sanest thing I've heard in a while. <laughs> Zane! You're all right, Tom. Hey, we like him, don't we, bro? He's got to go to the farm. The Anderson Farm. Valhalla! We wrote it all down, lest we forget. A crash course. All you need to know to get your head right. You need to find the message. Here, Sonny, here's something for you. Gave me a rash, but I kept it safe from these bastards. My head was clearing up, or according to Hartman, I was sinking back into the fantasy. I was convinced he was lying to me, about everything. Crazy or not, the Andersons made more sense. Zane could feel the poems, taking form, shaping things. As he experimented, he imagined he could almost feel the power surging through the keys of the typewriter. It exhilarated him, but there was fear too. If not for his young assistant Emil, he would have given it up, but Emil convinced him otherwise. He too had a way with words. Tom, you got any booze on you? Yeah, uh, no. <laughs> Sorry, we have guys. a stash of the special stuff at the farm. Our own formula, local ingredients, medicine, clears your head right up. Makes you remember like moonbeams on the brain. Oh, I just noticed! Leather patches on the elbows? That's not very rock and roll. Tom just lost is all. Baba Yaga got to him too, the damn witch. She used us all. Taken from all of us. Took my thunder, the witch. And my ravens. What was... What were they? <laughs> Memory and thought, the hag. She took something from you too, didn't she? That's what she does. Um, we're better off. This place, the lake, it gives you power. If you're a creator, an artist, a god. Nightmare shifted in their sleep in the darkness of the lake. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. She makes sure it comes out twisted and wrong. Just ask the lamp lady. She knows what happened to that other rider. She's been using you, boy. And you let her. You went and opened the door for her, didn't you? Now, now, it was already open a crack. And whose fault is that? We're morally corrupt, disease-ridden, old and stupid. Doesn't mean he had to open it all the way, goddammit. Ah, uh, So tired. Built the farm close to the lake. A place of power. We had parties there, man. You, you should go there and have a party. That Bob Baldur threw the app through the window. Hit that a hippie chick in the back of the head. Fifteen stitches of a concussion. Bob's dead now. Leukemia. Stitches, snitches, and narcs, man. 
bad scene. I am tired, man. So tired. So you can't wake up because I'm in charge now and I don't want to disappear. My nightmare is the publisher people who want to make a contribution so they can say they made a contribution. And then we end up with mullets in there because they think mullets are funny. But it wasn't supposed to be about mullets. And now it's about mullets. And when it's in slow motion, they call it mullet time because the numbers came back from marketing that mullet time is the hook we needed to go big in the target demographic. And they're not even kidding. They say it all like serial killers with straight faces and smiles. My nightmare is the writers who want to make everything from the characters to the toasters talk, talk, talk all the time and express their feelings so they won't shut up. And the writers won't shut up either because they have feelings too. And I have to listen to them because they're not scared of me. And everyone should just shut up, shut up, shut up. But I don't see nightmares pairs anymore because I'm too scary for them. I take two pills every morning and one with every meal and four when I go to bed and that makes me the scariest nightmare of all. Hmm. Oh, hello. I've painted you. Okay. I was just struck by inspiration a couple of days ago. Dr. Hartman wanted me to paint landscapes, and that's what I was doing. But now I've been doing these things, a lot of them. The images just keep coming. Dr. Hartman likes them. He has them in his office. Yeah? He's very proud of me. He says I'm getting much better. I think I'm getting better. Well, I guess I'd better start wrapping this up. The storm is almost here. Look at that. I'd hate to be out there tonight. you humor Dr. Hartman and give the writing a shot, huh? The typewriter's in your room. You can get to your room by those stairs, Wake. The doors were locked. Hartman and the nurses would have keys, but there was no way to get my hands on them. Everything else is a blur. I'm trapped in this cabin. Have been for days, but it's always dark outside. My editor is real. I saw her again. She's not human. It's not human. A dark presence is wearing the old woman's face. She was covered in clinging shadows. There's a hole in her chest where her heart should be. I think I've made a horrible mistake. I don't think I'm any closer to saving Alice. It's been lying to me, using me to get the story it wants, and the story will come true.
Hartman wanted me to write. I knew I couldn't, but I figured I should just play along for now. It was the only thing I could do with Nurse Birch watching me like a hawk. Hartman had mentioned that the power had been acting up. Maybe that was the reason for the generator and the work light on the balcony. The generator hadn't been activated, and there was no key. The white glare of the blank page in front of me hurt my eyes. My hands began to shake uncontrollably. Hey, wake! You stay here. I'm gonna go see what's up. You just keep doing what you're doing. Be cool, okay? chaos was all about, but it could be my only chance of getting out of here. talking, giving Barry the grand tour, clearly proud of the place. He went on and on about his hunting trophies, and Barry was impressed. But he was here on business. He raised his voice, cut through the monologue. Hey, Hartman, where's Al? Hartman stopped in mid-sentence, annoyed at the interruption. He nodded at the hulking orderly standing nearby. The man smiled and clapped a practiced hand on Barry's shoulder. It's my store! I'm taking it! We're on a comeback door, baby! Sinclair looked bad. That wasn't a love tap. The crazy old fart hit her hard. And if she was one of Hartman's goons, she had it coming. Hammer's I could get the key to the office room right from Sinclair. The backstage is all yours, Tom! Seize your destiny! Come out and face the music, Birch! It's time to pay the piper! Maybe you could come out and beat our wrinkled, adult, diapered asses for us, since you're so tough, Birch. We were on the road, man! You think we haven't seen punks like you before, <laughs> mortal <laughs> knave? <laughs> yeah, you better hide, Birch. My wrath will break you. He's probably kidding, Birch. He's got a great sense of humor. Just ask Sinclair. Ah. Oh. Children of the Elder God, scourge your light upon the dawn. I had to get to Hartman's office. He had taken all my manuscript pages. Wow, wow, wow. That's where he'd be keeping them. I wish I had my axe. Oh, memory and thought, get black and clawed. <laughs> The 
photo on the wall caught my attention. In it, the clinic staff was standing outside the lodge. I knew the man next to Hartman. He was the kidnapper. Hartman had been playing me all along. Hartman wasn't happy. Mott could see it in his eyes. He quickly lowered his own. He had made a mess of it, and he knew it. The shame of failure was hard to bear. He hadn't expected Wake to say he needed more time, and he blurted out two days, less than Wake had asked for to show him who was in charge. But that wasn't part of Hartman's plan. The markings on the tape said they were recordings Hartman had made of the sessions with his patients. I saw Alice's name on one of them. For a moment, I couldn't breathe right. Now, Mrs. Wake, can you tell me about Alan's problems? He's more and more out of control all the time. The parties, he's so angry all the time. He's getting violent, he's... Do you mean with you? No, not with me. No, never. I... Sometimes I almost wish Alan would take a swing at me. Because at least that'd lead to a conversation he couldn't just march out of. But no. He just... Alan doesn't really sleep. And the work, well, he's not writing. At all. He sits there for hours and just gets more and more frustrated. And I can't talk to him. Yes. Tell me, Mrs. Wake. What would you say to him if he'd listen? <sighs> I don't know. I want to say, I look at you, and it's not you. Just some stranger who resembles you. Looking out from behind your eyes, and I don't like that guy much. And now it's all gonna go to hell. But you don't ever say this. No. No. I've tried, but he's not listening. He's too deep in his own problems, always going on about something else. I'm so afraid I'm gonna lose anymore. He doesn't let me in anymore. He just keeps me in the dark. I'm so alone here, even when he's home. Please help me, doctor, because I'm at my wit's end. Well, if you can just get him here, I'll absolutely do my very best. Yeah, but doctor, you need to be careful with him. He's not just going to listen to you and cooperate. He's the most stubborn man I've ever met. Well, I'll be sure to bear that in mind. Hearing her voice, what she was saying made me happy and sick and guilty all at once. Worst of all, I recognized the words, the phone call from her. It had been a cut up of this, just a recording. Rudolph Lane's case is interesting. He was completely blocked and frankly, I was about to discard him as useless. However, once Wake arrived and started writing, something changed in Rudolph. He's producing extraordinary work, increasingly dark pieces. Unfortunately, he doesn't respond to direction at all. And it's my belief that he's not so much a creator as an illustrator, perhaps. A recorder of sorts. I hadn't considered the existence of such a role before, let alone its implications, but the paintings he has produced are informative. At least he's easily controlled and useful. I wish I could say the same about Wake. It's frustrating that the best subjects are always so damn difficult to deal with. I'm buying that. I was tailing Wheeler, and this is the only place he could have gone. That means Wake is probably there too! Agent Nightingale, this is private property, and I will not allow you to disturb my patients. Yeah? I can get a warrant. How are your fragile little patients like that? <laughs> oh, I'm thoroughly intimidated by your mighty authority now, Agent. Listen, you smug snot. How would you like it if I busted through this gate and knocked you around a little? Agent Nightingale, first of all, I'm recording this conversation, so you might want to watch what you say. Secondly, you're not dealing with a hick now. I know the law, and if you can get a judge to grant a warrant, I'll be glad to cooperate. But you won't get one. 
be advised that any further communications with me are to be made through my lawyer. I don't believe this. Good day, Agent. Yeah. see you. We need to get to Hartman's office. It's right next door. You okay? Yeah. I mean, no! The cops found me at Rose's trailer, but they didn't hassle me too much. I'm obviously a victim in this, and I demanded to be treated as such. Or else I'd sue their asses. Speaking of asses, that fed gave me a real hard time, but I had no clue where you were. That guy's crazy, Al. But he let me go, and then I get a call from Hartman, that son of a bitch, who tells me you're here, and I should come pick you up. But when I got here, two goons clobbered me and stuck me in there. What's... what's with the cutout? I stole it from the diner to piss off Rose after what she did to us. That'll teach her. Yeah, that's a harsh punishment. Come on, pal, we gotta get going. These were all the pages I had on me, and more. Alan, please, you're sliding back Shh, into the- Tell me one more lie and I'll shoot you in the face. Ah, well, it was worth a shot. Really, Wake, come on, let's work together on this. You have no idea- Hartman, what... shut up! Barry, get out of here. I'll catch up with you. Get a car. Oh, Al, let's just- Go! Wake, listen to me. This is a mistake. Don't you see? Together we can create something absolutely wonderful with your ability and my- followed the fall of Alan Wake with his binoculars. When the rider hit the water, he ordered Jack to take the boat to him. The spot was easy to see in the dark, even with all the extra lights in the boat. The flare floated and kept burning even in the water. Jack turned the radio louder as the engine sputtered. The music was rough and clanking, something the Anderson brothers would no doubt have enjoyed. But Hartman chose to ignore it. Wake was finally within his reach.
most of us have felt its shadow on us. A shiver down your back. A glimpse from the corner of the eye. You can't find it on purpose. But take a wrong turn. Board the wrong bus. Wonder where you are when you wake up. And you will find yourself in the small town of Night Springs. Tonight's episode, The Doomed Samaritan. Sometimes, even the simplest things prove impossible. Consider, you get in a car and leave a life behind. Easy? Not tonight. Thanks for the ride, Mark. I'm so glad to be leaving this place. You have no idea. What, Night Springs? Come on, Linda. Relax. It's not that bad. Hey, what's that up ahead? Oh, God. There's someone in the road. I think there's been an accident. Are you all right? Oh, no, Linda! Oh, no! It was me on the road! I... Wait! Tell him to watch out for the truck! Watch out for the truck! My... My God! Mark? for the ride, Mark. I'm so glad to be leaving this place. What, Night Springs? Come on, Linda. Relax. It's not that bad. Hey, what's that up ahead? Oh, God. There's someone in the road. I think there's been an accident. Are you all right? Oh, no, Linda! Oh, no! It was me on the road. I... Wait! Tell him to watch out for the truck! Watch out for the drug! My... my god, Mark! Ah! And there you have it. A vicious cycle, brutally punctuated by the blast of an air horn and screaming metal. Many roads are dangerous, but none more so than the one that leads away from... Night Springs. Magic. Parlor tricks, smoke and mirrors. But for some, magic is more than that. It's a way of working the secret machinery of reality itself. And more than one member of that Eldritch Brotherhood can be found in Night Springs. Tonight's episode, What's in a Name? We find an old man standing on an old, rusting, derelict bridge, leaning his bony frame against the cold steel. And though he looks idle, he is hard at work. His young apprentice attends to him, as good apprentices do. Yes, yes. Coming along nicely, don't you think, boy? Yes, Magus. Sir, we've been getting some complaints. Are you defacing the bridge? Oh. No, I wouldn't do that. Sir, I can see the screwdriver in your hand and the scratches on the steel beams. You've been spotted doing this all over town. Yes. I have been very busy, but I'm no vandal, officer. Exactly. What are you up to, sir? He's writing his name on the town. The youngster is correct. I'm writing my name, my whole name, the entire and complete description of my soul on the town. I'm almost done. Yeah? Well, all I see is an old man tagging public property. Oh, I should bow down to the wisdom of your years? Words have power, young man. Names and titles especially. Uh-huh. And uh, what's your name supposed to be? <laughs> Tell him, boy. Tell him while I finish the carving. Officer, it's... it's... Say my name, boy. Say it. It's Night Springs, officer. But isn't that... that's the name of the town, isn't it? Yes, it is from now on. Wait, wait where'd he go? Hey, where is he? Oh, officer. You know where he is. And what he is. Don't you? I think you should get in your car and drive away. And remember which town you're serving.
Your will be done, Magus. Ah, yes. There are too many little towns to count, all of them with some little magic of their own. But some towns have more personality than others, and none more so than Night Springs. Hartman knew he was no creator. He had no ambitions on that front. And he certainly didn't want to end up like every artist he had worked with here, damaged in ways that were hard to describe, or worse. It was enough for Hartman to maintain creative control and provide direction, to be a producer. That was what most of these people were in need of anyway. Of course, suitable subjects were few and far in between. locked. You're gonna have to go through the hedge maze over there. Barry, I don't have a light. Take this, Al. Oh, God! Look at the house, Al! Look out!
I stared at the Viking paraphernalia that littered the area, surrounding an unlikely centerpiece. A full-side stage complete with an impressive sound system with all the trimmings, including a dragon. It took a special kind of crazy to build something like this in a remote field. When the sky split open with a deafening boom and the music started blasting, it felt strangely appropriate. Hartman hurried down the corridor. He had disliked leaving Wake when he was surely at his most susceptible to therapy. But this was not an ordinary storm. Wake had been riding, and he had woken something up in the depths of the lake. Now, it was coming for him. Hartman had naturally prepared for a situation like this. The idiot brothers would keep Wake distracted while Hartman double-checked everything, just to be sure.
Mott knew that Wake was smarter than him. Wake had more money, a beautiful wife, everything. And Hartman said Wake was important. That made him better than Mott. But Mott was calling the shots now. He'd expected Wake to whimper and grovel, but instead, he seemed willing to fight. Mott knew he'd gotten under Wake's skin, if only Mott actually had his wife. The thought made him shiver. For the moment, Barry was just glad he had survived the fall. He had been separated from Al, and there was no easy way to climb back up. He told himself he'd be okay, okay in the gloomy forest at night. He would just have to wait for a while for Al to find his way down. Barry turned when he heard the heavy footsteps and saw the movement. The man-shaped shadow lunged at him from the bushes, an ax held high. Barry screamed and threw up his hand. The world exploded.
Hartman watched as Wake's features slackened. The man was bullheaded, no doubt. Even lying on the bed, he'd almost broken Hartman's nose the second time. But with a little time, he could break Wake down, give him proper direction. Wake was easily the most promising subject he had had. Well, since Tom, really. Sleep well, Alan, Hartman whispered with a smile. Let me take care of you. He sniffed hard to clear his throbbing nose, swallowed blood, and barely tasted it. Get out of here. Can you open this gate? Maybe. Barry. Uh, well, I slammed it shut when the nasty showed up, and the key fits kind of loose in the lock, so, uh... for the nearest. You're now leaving Bright Falls. Come back soon, sign. We're going to the Anderson farm. I knew you were gonna say something like that. You know what? You owe me big time for this. When this is through, if we make it, I don't care what anybody says, I'm done with darkness. You're gonna buy me a tanning bed as a gift, and I'm gonna live in it. Crazy, but that's fine, Barry. <laughs> oh, you got that right, Al. You're barking mad. You are by far the craziest. But maybe that's inevitable when you deal with crazy stuff like this. It helps. This is happening, Barry. Alice, they never had Alice. She's trapped in the darkness at the bottom of the lake, but she's not dead. Al, how can you know that? I know, Barry. I can. Al, I. No, listen. I can bring her back. I can find her. There's something special about this place. The lake, it, it does something to the works of art created here. It makes them come true. But there's a catch. The dark presence, whatever that thing is, twists it to its own ends. That's why all of this is happening. It's using my manuscript to take over everything. Al, I believe you. It happened to Thomas Zane before. It happened to the Andersons. I believe you. Crazy or not, you're not delusional. Weird shit's going down. That's a fact. I'm on board, man. I'm with you. The Andersons knew about it, but they were too far gone to tell me with all the drugs they were on. But they wrote it down. There's a message somewhere at their farm, Barry. We just need to find it. Look out! my gun in the crash. Barry was nowhere to be seen. Barry! Barry! Oh, man, you're okay! Jeez, it's 
good to hear your voice! I was trying to get out of the car, but the ground gave way! Man, what a drop! And don't worry, your cutout is fine. Forget that! Are you okay? I hit some bushes, didn't get a scratch! There's no way you can climb down, though! It's like a sheer wall! Ah! Ow! There's something moving down here! Mary, it's a take it! Use a flare, Barry! Oh, yeah! Barry, are you alright? <laughs> I'm good, Al! I'm great! Guess he never messed with anyone from New York City before, huh? me, okay? Ow! I'm not staying here! It's suicide! I'm going to the farm! I'm gonna go ahead and secure the area! You can catch up! Don't worry about it! I'm on the case! Now he's Rambo. This would turn into a disaster if I didn't catch up with Barry. stopped the car at the Anderson farm, Walter felt relieved. Oblivion was close at hand. The brothers wouldn't miss a jar of moonshine or two in the booby hatch. But then he saw the man on the porch, and he knew who it was. Driving for his life and knowing it was useless, he didn't realize he was crying until he couldn't see the road for the tears. Agent Nightingale stared at the passed out rider. The man was sleeping off one hell of a night. Nightingale felt a stab of envy at Wake's oblivion. 
but he had a job to do. He put the gun to Wake's head and almost became a murderer. His hand shook and his throat felt tight and dry. Biting his teeth, he tried again to pull the trigger. He lost the nerve. Wake stirred. Nightingale would have to settle for an arrest. I hoped there'd still be a working generator somewhere around here to power up the old lights by the gate. Since the movement in the woods ahead, facing the enemy without a weapon was dangerous, but I had no choice. driving away from the farm, headed in the same general direction as I was. For all I knew, it was Barry, caught in the consequences of leaping before looking. was heading for the cabin up ahead. It wasn't far. If it was Barry, I would see the damage soon. glimpses of the light before. I had seen it in my dream. It was a strange spaceman or a diver in a bulky suit. He was the one who'd been placing the pages on my path. The dark presence followed the choreography laid out to it in the manuscript, growing stronger and stronger, moving like a storm from one scene of destruction to the next. But it was still bound to follow the story and chain to the dark place it came from. When the story reached the end it longed for, it would finally be free.
Someone had left a gun behind. Now I had a fighting chance of reaching the farm. The storm raged on as the Anderson brothers walked unsteadily away from the clinic with the other patients in tow, knowing that this time they wouldn't return. The darkness around them seethed with horrors, but Tor and Odin were unafraid. Their eyes glinted with guile. They knew every secret path, and there was blood on their hands. They had fought these shades before. see the car, but there was no sight of the driver. Hello? Anybody here? Ah! Barry? Ah! Ah! No! Danny, you're not! Ah! Please! Ah! Oh, oh, what are you? What are you? Ah! jail the other day. I went to the farm again for the moonshine, you know? It makes you see they're, they're not gonna miss it. They're in the loony bin. But my buddy, Danny, I lost him. Something's gone wrong with him. It's not him. Like a real bad follow-up to a real good movie. The best friend's suddenly the bad guy who, who wrote this crap anyway. course in my head. If I continue like the Dark Presence wants me to, the story I'm writing won't save Alice. It's a horror story, and it's going to kill her, and me, and everybody in this town. No one will survive. Darkness will consume everything. This is what it's wanted all along. It will be free, unstoppable. It used Alice to get to me, dangled her in front of me to keep me going. It was never going to release her. I'm going to change this. I'll escape. I've written myself into the story. I'm now the protagonist. This 
feels like a terrible risk, but it's the only way to save Alice. I'll be bound by the events of the story just as much as anyone else who's been woven into it. The story must stay true for this to work. There have to be victims along the way, near escapes, cliffhangers. In a horror story, it can't be certain that the hero will succeed or even survive. He almost has to die. I'll write my own escape into the story next. I need help. Zane's going to be the one who will help me. I'll make it happen. Front door was locked. The farm was still a good distance away. I'd need a car to get there fast. For a moment, Hartman considered strangling the idiot. Mott was mean-spirited, but easily manipulated. An emotional infant who lived for his approval. Wake, by contrast, was a far more difficult subject. Mott had given him too much leash. In two days, who knew what could happen? Hartman would have to find a way to rein him in, and quickly.
Well, as I'm sure everyone's noticed, that storm we all felt coming is finally here. The boys at the Weather Service reckon it'll last until morning, at the very least. Uh, pertaining to that, let me uh, read that missing persons alert again. The Sheriff's Department's still looking for a Caucasian woman, 30 years old, slim and blonde with blue eyes. She may be lost in the woods, and it's possible she's been injured in a car accident. If you see her, please make sure you get her indoors and call the sheriff. It's bad weather to be caught out in, so if you see someone in the area who maybe looks a little confused, give him a hand, all right? <clears throat> this is Pat Main on KBF FM, hoping you're all safe and warm.
Hartman had never felt as anxious as during the week after Maude had managed to lose the wakes. Their car stood by the path that had once led to Diver's Isle. Hartman thought about Thomas Ain's cabin in the depths. It was only a matter of time before Wake started riding. They had to be found, and fast. The moment he heard on the police radio that Sheriff Breaker had picked up Wake, he was already in his car driving toward town. I'd known the brothers used to be some kind of rock stars, but it hadn't really sunk in until I saw the stage. Al! Run! It's coming! There's too many of them! God damn! Glad you decided to go it alone, Mr. Bronson. Shut up and shoot!
Bright Falls, rock and roll capital of America. Deputy Mulligan tuned Thornton's chatter out. He didn't think riders were particularly useful people, and a huge manhunt for one stuck him as idiotic. Certainly not worth the missed opportunity for coffee and pie. It wasn't even clear what the man had done, except run from them at the trailer park. Mulligan knew he wasn't alone. The sheriff's patience with the Fed was running out. Bestseller, no reason to worry. Your cutout's good as new, right where I left it. I'll come back for it once we have the place secured. Yeah, that's been my biggest worry all this time. We need to get this thing moved out of the way. This is as far as I got before they ambushed me. As the deputies hauled Wake and Wheeler away, Agent Nightingale eagerly examined the stack of papers Wake had been carrying. It was incomplete, a collection of random pages, but there was enough. He saw his own name in there, among others. His hands shook with emotion. Finally, it was proof. He had been right all along. Here has something to say. Ooh, uh, what's that, Al? Ooh, I'm Alan Wake. I'm always right about everything. And if I don't get my way, I'll sulk all day long. I'm always intense and moody. It makes me very attractive and mysterious. Right now, I'm just standing here because I need my best friend Barry to carry me. But that's okay. I can just take him for granted. I think I see what you did there. Yeah. It was pretty good. You want me to do my imitation of Barry Wheeler? No? Thought so. So how come I never heard of these guys before? And this from the guy who learned about Ozzy Osbourne through reality TV?
sleep. We all spend oh, a third of our nights in a soft embrace, Man. somewhere What's between that memory? fantasy and hey, oblivion. Hey, remember when I got you that gig? But your first real writing job. What got you started? Life. Was this one of your episodes? Vice versa. In Night Sprays. Tonight's episode. The Dream of Dreams. Ah, that's by someone else. We join Mr. Jones as he explores the endless dreamscape, only to be brought to a sudden stop by a decidedly mundane situation. A long line of people. Hey, Jones, right? Listen, we're gonna have to wait until his highness over there is good and ready. Oh, wow, who's that? You don't know him? What are you, new? He's the guy dreaming us. Well, not just us. He dreams everything, all of this. But wait, no, I'm the one who's dreaming. I'm asleep. Isn't... isn't this my dream? Oh, yeah. Sure. Get real, pal. You're just another dream. I'm a dream. You're a dream. The weirdo in the diving suit is a dream. And the girl made of smiles and sunshine is definitely a dream. But I'm pretty sure I'm dreaming this. Well, maybe you're a really confused dream. What am I, a shrink? All I know is I'm going with the smart guys. And they say that's the guy doing the dreaming. Right there. I don't know what that means. It means we keep him happy. No sudden falls. We make sure he has his clothes on when he goes out in public. No chases where the monster is nipping at his heels and he runs like crazy, but his legs don't seem to get him anywhere. None of that. Because if he wakes up in a cold sweat... Uh... Yeah, precisely. So we wait till he wants to move on. Keep things nice and calm. Hey, something... Something's happening here. Yeah? What's that? What? Can't you hear that? Oh, God help us. It's an alarm clock. Oh, it's you, isn't it? Please, man. I got a wife and kids. Please don't wait. It's 1976. Madness reigns at the Anderson farm. Contrary to all logic, the headiest ingredient of their moonshine is unfiltered water from Cauldron Lake. The Andersons feel like gods. Odin can't stop laughing. He contemplates cutting his eye out. Tor runs across the field, naked, shrieking, hammer in his hand, trying to catch lightning. Their songs have power. Something ancient is stirring in the depths, coming back. The Viking boat looked imposing, almost like a battering ram.
geezers had quite a production going on. Oh, you know what, Al? If we make it through this alive, I'm gonna start representing them. Yep, sell this stuff online, maybe get a reality show going, release a new single. Good luck with that, pal. Hey, you find us a way out of here, okay? I'm gonna take a closer look at this stuff. Be careful, Al! Okay? As you regular listeners know, I tend to work through the night, but I'm not the only one. Deputies Mulligan and Thornton are taking a couple of moments off their busy schedule to join me here in the studio. Boys, how busy are you now? Deerfest is almost here, isn't it? I, I bet that keeps you in business. Pretty busy, yeah. Actually, Pat, we've been real busy with other stuff. Which concerns an ongoing investigation. We can't talk about that, Lord. I wasn't gonna say anything. I, I was just saying we got, you know, other irons to fry. And how would you compare your workload to last year's? Things have seemed relatively peaceful to me, but people do tend to get a little wild this time of year. Oh, it's wild, Pat. It's pretty wild. There's been all sorts of trouble this year. Vandalism, fighting, public disturbances. A lot of people gone missing, too. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's pretty much the uh, usual stuff, Pat. Uh, just, you know, uh, a lot more of it. Now, is it just me, or does Deerfest get wilder every year? People seem to be more drunk, at least, or they start earlier and younger. Oh, it's definitely not just you, Pat, but... Definitely, Pat. Hey, I'm talking here, Thornton. Uh... Oh, shoot, I lost my train of thought. Not just me. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's wilder, Pat, but actually most of the trouble seems to be coming from grown men. People who ought to know better, you know? Kids are doing fine this year. Well, that's nice to hear, at least. Boys, I want to thank you for stopping by. I'll let you get back to your patrol. Sure thing, Pat. Yeah, sure thing, Pat. side of the field. It wasn't far now. I wasn't worried about trusting the ramblings of two burned-out geriatric wrecks. They had the goods.
Yeah, it's me. Hang on. I'll try to find a key to get the door open. I had to find a key to get Barry out. Hey, watch the holdup. Come on, this place is all dusty. You know I got my allergies. Come on, Al, open the door already. Seriously, I don't like it in here. Holy crap. I think I lost some body weight with that one. Let's go, man. I think we're gonna have to work together to open this gate, Al. Looks pretty heavy. Ah! Hey, I think that's the farm on the other side of the field. We're almost there. This farm is a crazy place for crazy people. We should feel right at home then. Are out. I guess we better check the fuse box. The power downstairs was out, but I was sure I could fix that at the fuse box. This place looks kind of lived in. I thought the Andersons were in the booby hatch. Yeah, I don't think they keep too close an eye on them at the clinic. They seem to slip away a lot so they can get wasted. No kidding! Those guys sound awesome. Come on, Al, let's get the lights on, huh? Alice's screams rang in the stillness of the night. I saw myself run toward the cabin, flashlight in my hand. I followed my past self. I was an out-of-body observer, a time traveler in a crazy drunken dream. This was the beginning. The night Alice had disappeared. The mystery of what had happened during the missing week was about to reveal itself. We're here. Lady of the Light? Oh, that's gotta be... What's her face? The crazy lamp lady from the town. Cynthia Weaver. Right. Must be.
Okay. We need to find Cynthia Weaver. We'll stay here for the night and head back to town as soon as it gets light. Hey, Al. Lots of hours before dawn. Might as well get some rest. And by rest, I mean drunk. Come on, Barry. This is... Yeah. What the hell? Find her, right? And even though you're a crazy bastard, I'm gonna stick by you. No matter what, ever, Al. Sure, like a brother. I'm a writer, goddammit. Correct. If I just wanted to, I could write ten books a year. And and they'd be the best books that year. No, you couldn't. That's right, I couldn't. But I could, because I'm a writer. What? What do they put in this stuff? I feel like my brain is coming out of my nose. <laughs> I'm gonna get the recipe off those coots and be a, a, a booze millionaire. I just miss her, Barry. I just want her here with me. I know, Al. I know. It's gonna be okay. We're gonna make it okay. crazy drunken dream, and yet it was more than that. It was the truth, a suppressed memory unearthed by the Andersons' moonshine. I was there, an out-of-body observer. This was the night Alice and I had arrived at Bright Falls, the night Alice had disappeared. I had a chance to find out what had happened. I remembered being surprised to see the cabin dark. Alice would have never turned the lights off. Alice? Alice! I remembered thinking, I caught a glimpse of her form underwater, sinking into the darkness. <gasps> Diving after her was the last vague memory I had of that night. After that, the next thing I could remember was waking up behind the wheel of the crash car and finding the first pages of the manuscript. <gasps> I couldn't find her in all that blackness. I must have thought she drowned. Alice! Jagger had Alice, Alice. and so she had me. Alice! I'd been easy prey. Look at the cabin. Is there someone in the window? Alice? Maybe she didn't drown after all. Maybe she's inside. Alice! Yes. The dark presence had touched me. She had dug her nails into my brain and used me. Made me her puppet. She must be here somewhere. Maybe upstairs in the study. Alice! Yes, that's where she is. You can apologize. Alice! You laugh at the whole thing together and put it behind you. Alice? She's not here. You were foolish to think so. No, she's dead. She drowned. No, no, no! It's your fault your wife is dead. You are guilty. All she wanted was to help you right. You killed her. Ah! 
Oh, hush. There's still hope. Cauldron Lake is a special place. Here, you have the power to change things. She wanted you to write. I will tell you what to do. You can write her back. The story will come true, and all will be well again. She had Alice, and the manuscript was the ransom for her. Yes. I'll write. I'll fix it. I'll bring her back. No. I wrote it. I remembered it all now. In the dark, I'd written for days, a week, almost a complete manuscript of a novel entitled Departure. Jagger had been my editor, whispering in my ear, making sure that the unfolding story would make her more and more powerful. I thought I was saving Alice. Even with the cobweb she put in my head, some part of me had been aware enough to write my escape into the story, to bring a light into the cabin to release me before I could finish, to interrupt the horror story before the ending, where darkness consumed everything and everyone. Zane was weak and far away, but I had written him into the story and his light had been enough to set me free. It isn't here now. I'm here because it was written. I brought the light to set you free. You must hurry. We'll know I'm here. It will be back soon. It stole the skin of my barber a long time ago. She looks so old. I had woken up, confused and groggy, my mind consumed by darkness and fear. All I could do was to escape. Barbara. The week spent in the cabin had taken its toll. I was barely conscious and fading fast. Had to have cost Zane terribly, thrown him even deeper into whatever dark place he now haunted. But he had managed to weaken the dark presence, kept me safe that night. I wrote it. It's my fault. That's right, James Joyce. It's your fault, and you're gonna pay for it. There's an old tarot with mystery atop the poet and his muse, and a magic lake which gave a life to the words the poet. The muse she was his happiness And he reigned about her grace And told the stories of treasures Deep beneath the blackened ways Till in the stillness of wonder And still in its misty crown The muse she went down to the lake And in the waves she drowned And now to see your love set free When 
Darkness of the land. 